Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the um, PSEP general meeting for January 2022. We're glad that you've come to be here at the meeting tonight. We're just going to run over um, a little bit of uh, ground rules and some um, a picture here for any of you who are new to Zoom. Well, here we're going to go to the next slide. Is um, here are our group values, um, which are to listen actively and respectfully, share the airtime, be present and open to new information and perspectives, assume positive intent, respect each other, respect the group, speak your own truth, yeah. communicate directly, honestly, and respectfully, ask questions to clarify, call out bias, and be okay with ambiguity. And those are the PSEP values that were that um, were um, adopted by the PSEP for their functioning with each other. Um, so here's what we would love for you to pay attention to for housekeeping is to keep the sound off unless talking. Um, in the participant box, please use the raising hands feature um, and we will show you a slide that has that. Um, Feel free to turn off the video if you are not a presenter or a PSEP member. Use the chat box to communicate needs um, to staff. Claudia and I are the staff. Um, staff will ensure that we don't have Zoom bombing. If something starts, we are on it and taking care of it. It may take us a minute, but we are working on it. Um, recording, um, not all member, all meetings are recorded. These meetings are recorded and so, um, and are also live streaming. And we thank Open Signal for being our partner in that. And we have a, a piece of YouTube channel. You can find this and other meetings. Um, and we please hold questions for the public comment period of the meeting and keep public comments on hold until the public Q&A period. We, uh, especially when we have larger groups of people, we can get, um, we can end up with um, too much going on in the chat box. We need it to track questions coming in, to speak with each other, to make sure the meeting is running smoothly. And if people start getting a big conversation going in the chat box, we can't really support the meeting. And we have a lot of neurodivergence in the world. We all process differently and listening to two meetings simultaneously is a, a rare skill, I think. Not all of us can do it. So. We're just gonna ask everybody to have the be in the same meeting together. Um, and thank you, Dan, I will change your name. Is there um, anything else that um, people have questions about before we start just on those? All right, well then we're looking forward to be in the meeting with each other. I'm gonna call on the PSEP members to introduce yourselves and then we will have the subcommittee reports. So Anne, I see you right in front of me. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our meeting tonight. I'm Ann Campbell. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a PSEP member. Thank you, Ann. Byron. Hi, good, good evening, everybody. I'm Byron Vaughn, a PSEP member, uh, Behavioral Health Subcommittee. Thank you, Zainab. Good evening, everyone. My name is Zainab Folk, she, her pronouns, and I've been a member since November 2020 of PSEP, and I'm also the Settlement and Agreement and Policy Subcommittee member. Thank you. Thank you. Gloria. You're muted, uh, Gloria. Still muted, story of my life. Am I, am I still muted? Nope, we hear you now. All right, Gloria Canson. My pronouns are she and her. I am the chairperson for the youth committee of PSEP. Thank you, Gloria. Amy. Yes, good evening, everyone. Amy Anderson here, chair of the behavioral health subcommittee. Thank you. Are there other members? I don't see Celeste here yet. Amy, got Amy. Am I missing anyone? <clears throat> Any PSAP members in the room? 
Okay. Um, Tia is um, off on vacation and won't be with us this evening. So um, on the agenda, let me just bring up what I was looking at. We're now going to do subcommittee reports. Amy, would you please start with the behavioral health subcommittee report? Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> tonight's um, report out should also be including a letter that we, the Behavioral Health Subcommittee has been working on in regards to the uh, wellness program and its creation of the directives. So are we gonna launch that in chat, Judith, or where are we gonna put the letter? It is in chat now. Okay, well, we're not doing the chat. Yeah, and are you just sharing it, Amy? Because we're not doing a vote tonight. Right, I'm right. sharing it so people can read. Yep, there it is. we've been up to, a report has to, um, well, the end result is this letter of support in the um, formation of the directives for the wellness program. And that's what we've been working on. So I'm just gonna let others report out and you can read it in the chat and we'll be focusing on it in the future. Thank you, Amy. Um, and your next meeting is, as they always are, the, the first Tuesday of the month, correct? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Great. And we will be focusing on um, the directives for the mental health crisis and for the directors hold custody holds that happen to people who might need to go to a hospital. So we're going to be learning all about that. And you're welcome to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and all the meetings, all the subcommittees from now on are from 6 to 7.30. So next we have um, a request. I would like to wonder if Zainab, um, can you give the update and report for the Settlement Agreement Policy Committee? Thanks, Judith. Um, I was actually, um, the settlement agreement and policy subcommittee met on Thursday, January 13th at 6 p.m. Updates about the settlement agreement was provided by both the city of Portland and Department of Justice. Um, I don't believe Coco was present at the meeting, so we did not get an update on the subcommittee on the body worn camera community forum that was held on Sunday. The next day, Friday, January 14th, the city of Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler released a public statement about the 2018 training PowerPoint slides. Training is a critical compliance area for the police bureau related to the settlement agreement. Um, COCO has delivered quarterly reports since January 2015 um, in my role as a volunteer, but now also understanding as a public and city official serving as a member of the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing. It is important to outline our, area, our areas of concerns um, related to training and also to the reports um, provided by COCO um, in rela relations to the settlement agreement and policy. Our meetings are held on Thursdays. The, I believe it's the, is it the fourth Thursday of every month? Is that, or second? I'm not sure. I believe it's the time. third the third Thursday um, of every month. So our next meeting is February 10th um, at 6 p.m. We will share more. Thank you. Can I say a little something? I was just gonna ask Ann if you wanted to add anything as the other um, uh, person who's been very involved with the settlement committee. Thank you, Zainab. Uh, that was a great uh, recount of what the settlement and policy uh, subcommittee is doing. And I also wanted to um, recognize Zainab for stepping forward. She is now the um, chair of our settlement and policy subcommittee. Um, and I have done that before. And I know that requires a lot of additional work. And I really appreciate Zainab stepping up for that. Um, 
And I look forward to seeing everyone at our next meeting where we will talk about some of the issues that Zainab spoke about. And I also wanted to give a little plug since I have a moment here. Our listening session yesterday was fabulous. I wanna thank everyone who put that together. Um, and I just want to um, share one thing that was shared. We all heard yesterday, those that were there from a community member that said, I am a person with mental health issues. I deserve to call police for help and not be harmed. That really resonates with me and in my mind, uh, also, I'm a person, I'm a person of color. I deserve to call police for help and not be harmed. Uh, so I just, that's a guiding, those are guiding principles for me. And, um, and I hope others on the piece up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Anne. And also, I appreciate you also, let's remember you invited me to be on the subcommittee. And so I appreciate that too, um, reaching out to me as a new member um, to Peace Up. And I just hope that we will continue to have these necessary conversations related to the settlement agreement as Peace Up members. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. And that is, um, that's what goes on at the settlement agreement subcommittee. Um, there's obviously some places it bleeds into other things, but that is the primary focus is on the where we are on the settlement agreement. So really appreciate it. And for everyone to know, we are going to have our reports, um, check-ins, then we're going to have the COCO report, uh, quarterly report, and then we have a lot of time to also discuss the issue with the training um, tapes, because the training um, slide deck, because we know that's of a concern for folks. So appreciate that. Um, Gloria, would you update everybody on what's happening with the um, youth committee? Sure. Um, the youth committee is still in the planning stages of our April event. Our next meeting is 2-14-21. That's the second Monday of each month. Um, we definitely have been on the move. We've identified five speakers. We have a new flyer. We don't have an April date, but that's coming at our next meeting. So I hope to see you all there. That's April the, uh, sorry, February the 14th. Okay. Thank you, Gloria. And again, thank you to our new members um, who have stepped up to take leadership in the subcommittees. Um, uh, Celeste is not here yet. I've texted her. I'm not sure what's happening, um, but we could loop back for that report on the racial equity subcommittee. I will say that um, the, the training um, tape deck, the training deck was discussed at that meeting because it came out right before then. And um, the concerns were gathered and they, they've um, created, a, there's, there will be an additional racial equity subcommittee meeting in two weeks on February 3rd, which is Thursday, I hope, um, from six to eight. And um, one of the questions that Celeste has put out there is, what would the community like PSEP to do in this circumstance? How do they want PSEP to respond? What do they believe PSEP's role is? So that um, is one thing to be thinking about coming into that next meeting. So um, there will be that, that meeting. Um, looking now for, do we have an update from staff? Um, Claudia, do you wanna give any updates? No, Are you there? Okay. Well, I can start with an update. Um, and um, that is, uh, we are recruiting new members. Um, come join us. It's, um, it's very important work. It is the work of community and uh, government together which means it, it has highs and lows and, oh, the drama. I mean, really, we could be a reality TV show. So I really encourage you to come and join with us because this is a really important um, piece of, uh, of all of the collective energy that is going into police reform and making sure that we have police that are well-trained and able to respond to all of our communities 
um, well and equitably. So if you are interested there, we will, there you go. Claudia put the application in the box and we would love to talk to you about becoming a member. Is Claudia, did you have any other staff updates? I think the only thing that I'm looking forward to is uh, <clears throat> just letting folks know that we will, that when the recruitment starts, uh, just please uh, share the flyer and uh, with your networks and your community, um, we'll be sending out uh, recruitment flyers real soon. Thank you. Hey, Celeste is just coming in. So um, I'm gonna give her a second to get settled. Do, is there anyone here from the mayor's office to give a mayor's office update? Okay, um, how about uh, PPB? Um, do you have an update for us, Mary Claire? Sorry, I think the chief or assistant chief is here. Um, this oh, evening. I'm sorry, I didn't see, I didn't see, um, there's Chief Lavelle. I'm sorry, I didn't see you come in. Um, uh, no, thank, thank no you. No problem, for, Judith, good to see thank, you. Good to see you too, it's been a minute. Um, and um, we are happy that you're here. We at this point are just asking if there are any updates. This is just the regular update part we give every month. And then later we will also discuss more as we go through the COCO report and then have some open time to discuss the slide deck. Do you have any updates you'd like to share with, the, with us now? Uh, sure, I'll give a few updates. Um, I'll start with our focus intervention team. Um, we have our focus intervention team out and fielded as of the 19th of January, uh, two sergeants and 12 officers. They spent the last couple of weeks uh, getting trained up and spending some time working together before they hit the streets to do uh, gun violence work. Happy to come back to this work and in collaboration with the community oversight group, we call them the FITCOM. Uh, so they'll be out uh, responding to gun violence uh, going to scenes of shootings and progress and things of that nature. So we're excited about that. Um, we have our academic director position posted. Um, you might hear it referred to as the Dean um, of training sometimes. Um, and that person will be a civilian who will be um, in the academic advisor role at the training division. Uh, that's posted now and that position announcement is out and uh, that closes on the 7th of February. So I just want to give people an update on that. And then we recently uh, offers to eight background investigators um, to help us uh, bring on new folks and help us with our hiring as we go forward. So they'll work on both hiring uh, professional staff, sworn officers, and PS3. That, that we need it to says discuss. here on recruitment notice for new members. Closing. Yeah. It was a closing, so I thought it was going to be time to talk about that. But um, are we talking about it now or later at 740? We can talk about it. We can talk about it maybe later. I guess that would be the thing. I didn't know there. I we were just going to announce that recruitment is happening, and we wanted people to do it. So, so if as a PSAB member, I would like to share that I've been at other meetings and how they look at recruiting. Um, and so I think that um, we should look at other models, um, especially I looked at the Police Equity Advisory Council and how they're recruiting members. And they actually had an application on the city website, of, uh, um, not application, but a job posting or volunteer posting. And so I was wondering if we could get that too on the, from PSAP on that, um, and also look to other ways um, to look at recruitment. And also can the city look at if there are multiple applications that are provided from the community to serve as volunteers, that we don't wait a year for them to serve on a particular committee, that we refer them to committees that need volunteers. And so I'd just love to see that um, process in the city um, more strategic um, in its approach to really adding value from the community when it comes to these type of councils and committees. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. But let's put that on the steering committee um, agenda and uh, we do do um, some of what you've said, but um, there's always ways to improve and do better. So we'll look forward to talking with the steering committee about that for sure. Um, thank you. And Celeste, welcome. Um, are you are you ready to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, I'm off camera right now because I'm traveling. I got my hours mixed up again, thinking it was the six. 
So I'm in route downtown, from downtown. Uh, but I am Celeste Cherry. I am the chair of the Racial Equity Subcommittee. Apologies for being late. And uh, thank you all for coming and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Celeste. Um, Gloria. Yeah, I, you know, since uh, Chief Lavelle was still here, I yes. did have a question about the focus intervention team. I wanted to know, are all of these new officers, these aren't officers who were part of the team that all resigned at the same time. These are brand new officers, right? Chief Lavelle? Yeah, when you say resigned at the same time, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Are you talking in relation to previous gun violence work? Or? Yes, I am speaking of the gun violence team, the first one. Oh, um, no, these are all, all the officers are new to this work, I believe. Oh, good. Sure. 12 or good. previous GVRT folks. Good. And? I have a quick question. Um, Chief Bell, uh, can you, I know you didn't speak about it yet, but it, it made me wonder, um, the project about uh, rehiring some police officers that have retired, what is the status on that? Um, I know that um, both myself and Gloria reached out to you and others about wondering what the status would be uh, in terms of of rehires, what kind of uh, people you were considering for that? Yeah, so we sent out um, a mailer and made a phone call to all the people who retired in the last about year and a half or so. We went back to August of 20. Um, and there's not a lot of interest. I think we've got maybe um, five people who are interested, maybe just one or two who are actually um, ready to come into the process to come back. Uh, some of the challenges are we're going back um, to people who are already left. Um, a lot of them have other jobs already or have kind of moved on from law enforcement if they didn't want to continue their career. Um, some of them have gone to other agencies too where they can work beyond the two years that we would be able to offer in the retire rehire. So some of them are looking essentially to have a, another five-year career somewhere uh, in the PERS system. So there's not a lot of interest amongst those that group. We're looking to do another, um, another retiree hire batch for people who are retiring this July. We've got a significant amount of people who are eligible this July, and we're gonna make another offer. And that one I, I feel will be a little bit um, easier because those folks are still here um, there's not that break in service, and I think that that makes it kind of tough. Um, and one other quick follow up question um, in emails that we sent to yourself and others, we were wondering what the qualifications were going to be for those rehires, specifically if they've had any sort of complaints against them, if they've been involved in any sort of behavior that has uh, possibly been harmful to others. Those are my words. Right. Sure. No, I know that was a concern with um, a lot of community members, uh, folks on city council as well. And uh, ultimately the decision's up to the chief, but we're, we're not looking to bring back folks um, who aren't um, you know, top notch folks. We wanna bring back people who are ready to serve the community and um, there'll be a decision point and a vetting process that we do at the chief's office um, to make sure that we bring back the right people. Thank you. And you said the chief will have the final decision. Is that yourself? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, I have Zainab and then Celeste. Hi, um, thank you. Well, I had a question that came to mind, um, Chief Lavelle, and it only came to mind because I was reading information. Are you a member of the Chief of Police Association, the, Nas the National Chief of Police Association? 
Um, I am a member of the Major City Chiefs Association, the Oregon Association of Chiefs of Police, and the International Association of Chiefs of Police. International, okay, thank you. And then my other question was really for Judith, because I saw on um, the agenda the mayor's office, or did we have anyone from the city um, giving updates um, that have joined us? Has anyone come since I asked a few minutes ago? Okay, apparently oh, thanks, not. Chief Lavelle, thanks. Pardon me? I was saying thanks to Chief Lavelle. Great. Um, and I know that you shared, I did request to see if we can get an update from the Office of Equity and Human Rights, um, Human Rights um, Director as well, um, as these are all of the advisors or those that piece of has must advise when it comes to this um, piece, the settlement agreement. And so thank you, Chief Lavelle, for being here. Um, just note that um, the city mayor, the mayor is not here, nor has he sent a representative and neither has the Office of Equity and Human Rights. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Zainab, for bringing that up because a clarification that needs to be made is that the agreement with the Office of Equity and Human Rights has been when the mayor's office put together the piece up was that they needed a place for the um, admin work of the, of the um, having staff to be uh, handled. So that's how the staff ended up in the Office of Equity and Human Rights. The, the work of the PSEP is not in our strategic plan. It's not the work of our office. We have, we work on changing internal systems. We do work with the police, but not with the, not on the settlement agreement. So we have a different role and it is in the PSEP plan that the PSEP is to meet with the director twice a year, along with a whole bunch of other folks. So just for everybody's clarification, um, so that it's, so everyone understands exactly what the role is. Um, and so I see Celeste, you have your hand up. Yes, um, forgive me if this question has been asked, but I thought I heard a variation. Um, my concern was when Gloria was mentioning the former uh, gun task force people who had quit, I was wondering if she was referring to the rapid response team. Yeah. And I, okay, that's what I thought. And I wanted to get some clarity. So, just in case people got confused, I'm asking, have any members of the rapid response team expressed any interest in being part of this rehire? And if so, will they be held to the high standard we asked for, which is to be an exemplary officer? And that would be for Chief Lavelle, please. And thank you. I don't think any of the people who uh, have expressed interest in coming back were part of the rapid response team. Um, and I think, you know, we would have to judge that on a case by case basis too. I don't, you know, it's probably not fair to them to say, just because you are part of this team, you wouldn't be eligible for this, um, you know, for this opportunity retiree hire. I think we'd have to look at it to be fair to the individuals on a case by case basis. Okay, that's understood, that's understood. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Celeste. Are, do any other PSAP members have any questions for um, Chief Lavelle? Yes. Okay, yes, I see Gloria. Yes, you know, I, I my question wasn't about the retire, rehires coming back for this new team that Chief Lavelle put together the new team, I wanted to know had any of those officers, and he's answered the question, he said that to deny them a right to come back as a police officer would be wrong, but I'm talking about for this new response team, have, are they part of that? No, the, the people who quit, I think, that's the rapid response team. That's different than the gun violence reduction team. We had a gun violence reduction team, and that was essentially disbanded. Mm -hmm. People who are on the um, the new focus intervention team are not the same people who are on the gun violence reduction team. Oh, good. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Gloria. Welcome, Judith. Are, 
Are you staying, um, Chief Lavelle, for the whole meeting, or are you? Um... No, I'll be here for the remainder. Great, thank you. So we, we know you'll be here when we have the other discussions. Sure. Okay, um, great. So that actually brings us to the next step in our agenda, um, which is um, to, to have the, the COCO report. Um, the, for people who may be new, oh, okay, I'm gonna take just a second for um, some questions from the community. Dan and then Theo. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, I was trying to find out if there's normally this section and every section has a thing listed on the agenda about public input. I'm hoping it's okay for me to say a quick thing here and ask Chief Lavelle a question. Sure. Um, uh, so um, an article I read about the focus intervention team mentioned that they were getting some advice from the FBI and I think also the ATF, which I know are have deputized the officers in a different team that's dealing with investigations of gun violence. So what what's the relationship between those federal agencies and the FIT and is the community gonna be able to oversee that relationship? Yeah, I don't think there'll be a direct relationship between the focus intervention team and the FBI or ATF. We do have the ECST, Enhanced Community Safety Team, Will be working closely with the fit um, and my guess is that it's really more on the uh, ECST side where the relationship exists with the uh, what is the safe streets task force or the FBI. Thank you chief. But that part is more investigative in nature whereas fit is more patrol based and uniform. Rochelle. Yes, I also have a question for the chief. There was a, an article in the Oregonian recently about uh, the fact that a judge found uh, two uh, Portland police officers to have violated uh, policy, but that the police bureau did not find that those officers had violated policy. And I wonder if you could explain to the community how that's possible. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know exactly the incident you're talking about, but it is possible that um, depending on who's investigating something, we've had instances where, you know, maybe internally IPR or in IA or internal investigation look at something, and then perhaps it goes to agency, um, Oregon DOJ or some other uh, type entity that does find some violation or, or court, but I mean, it could happen. I don't know the, the exact particulars of the incident you're talking about. Though. Thank you, Chief. Um, Zainab. Oh, thank you. And one last question, and I'm gonna put it in the chat too. What is the United States, this is for um, Chief Lavelle, what is the United States States Department? Um, well, the U.S. has a, a Department of State, but um, I don't think we're really necessarily, I think our, our closest relationship is through the Department of Justice through our settlement agreement, but the, the U.S. does have a, a State Department, but they do mostly, if I'm not mistaken, foreign type type stuff, not law okay. enforcement. So there's no relationship with, between the Portland Police Bureau and the United States State Department? Um. Not that I'm aware of on a day-to-day -day basis, um, unless someone else knows different. I know we, we have a close relation with the Department of Justice through the settlement agreement, but I don't think we do a bunch with the Department of State. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know if, sorry to jump in if it's okay, Judith. No. Um, yeah. I don't, um, just so everybody knows, Heidi Brown, City Attorney's Office, and she, her, she, her are my pronouns, and um, Zainab, of course, you and I know each other, um, or we're getting to know each other. Um, I, I, if, if, and I'm not sure this is what you're asking at all, but if it relates to anything um, enforcement of immigration law, then um, the city would not be involved in that, and PPB would not. There's state law and city sanctuary city policy that would, um, 
prohibit that. But if it's something else, then I'm going far afield and then I apologize. <laughs> so just thought I'd add that in. Thank you, Heidi. So we appreciate it. We're gonna move on to our um, next agenda item, which is the COCO report. Um, and so we can start off with, I'm not sure, Dan, if, if it's gonna be you or Tom, um, the COCO is gonna give a report. And if you could also quickly say who, what the COCO is and your role at the beginning, and then um, there will be time for comments and questions from the PSEP members, and then there will be public, public comment. Sure, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to the PSEP members and staff for arranging this uh, town hall with us. Um, and thank you to the community for showing up and listening and participating. Um, I'm Dennis Rosenbaum, he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm the compliance officer and community liaison, also called a COCO. Uh, and I'll be presenting this evening along with my colleague, Dr. Tom Kristoff. Uh, we're gonna summarize our findings from the third quarter uh, of 2021, and we'll limit ourselves to less than 30 minutes, hopefully, and then open it up for questions and comments for the remainder of the time that we're allowed. Um, you know, for anyone who, as uh, Judith is saying, is not familiar with the process, our job, the job of the COCO team is to conduct an independent assessment of whether the city of Portland and the Portland Police Bureau um, have achieved full compliance uh, with the terms of the settlement agreement, uh, the agreement between the city and the United States Department of Justice that started back in 2014. Um, I have a team of experts that work with me, including Tom, and you know, we produce these quarterly reports. Uh, we're independent of the city and DOJ, and we produce these compliance assessments, such as the one you'll hear from us this evening. Um, Tom, if you do you have a, the PowerPoint we were going to use there, if we could just go to the first slide, and I want to I'll make a couple comments here in a second, but uh, see if we can can you go, can you see that? Okay, um, so let's go the first slide. The next slide is about uh, the sort of general overarching questions that we ask. They're the same as before. First, has the Portland Police Bureau in the city sustained the systems that are needed for reform or have they fallen out of substantial compliance with the terms of the settlement agreement? Uh, remember the city achieved full compliance, uh, substantial compliance as we call it back in January of 2020, but fell out of compliance in a number of areas after the mishandling of the protest during the summer of 2020. And the second question we ask is what actions, you know, have they taken to remedy the problems that uh, resulted in the reduced compliance ratings? Um, let me just go on to the next slide and just summarize for you what we're going to say tonight. This is an overview of our report. Uh, and uh, basically, the city remained in substantial compliance for these sections of the settlement agreement, community-based mental health services and crisis intervention. However, they remained out of compliance uh, for use of force, training, employee information system, officer accountability, and community engagement. So this evening, Tom and I will just talk briefly about each of these sections of the settlement agreement. But you know, before I dive in, I, I do wanna make, take a moment to just acknowledge the crisis that has developed in Portland over the release of this offensive meme uh, that was found in the training materials of uh, the Portland Police Bureau's rapid response team training. Um, I see this topic has been added to the agenda agenda tonight, so you know, I'm not gonna say that much about it right now. I just want you to know that the COCAL team uh, and DOJ learned of this very recently, along with everyone else after our third, this report was drafted. And it's, so it's not covered in there. Um, many, like many of you were shocked and offended by, the, uh, by this meme, the prayer of the alt night and making fun of protesters and suggesting that police violence against them is somehow justified. Uh, you know, we've all worked really hard in Portland, the volunteer members of the community and PSEP and other groups, uh, the COCAL team, the DOJ, and frankly, some members of the Portland Police Bureau in the city have worked hard to reform the Portland Police Bureau. So to make, you know, the changes that in policies and procedures and training and, 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 and the culture around use of force, and uh, how they've responded to demonstrations. We've been working on that. 
and how they treat vulnerable members of the community and their special needs. But this discovery, frankly, tells us that there's still a lot more work to be done. And we will wait to hear the results of, of these investigations before you know, we say too much, but clearly the reputation of the entire police bureau is tarnished by this and it raises questions about how deeply these sentiments reach into the police culture and what oversight and supervision exists for special units and, and many other issues. So I can promise you this, that the COCO will be keeping a critical eye on these investigations as they develop. Um, I want everyone to know that we place a very high value on integrity and honesty as the foundation for building trust in the police. So we are looking forward to you know, complete transparency and objective fact finding. Um, this is why we focus our critique on systemic issues. Are the systems in place to ensure that the Portland Police Bureau uh, and officers can do the right job and, and that they can be held accountable for not acting within these parameters. Um, you know, Kokel has always uh, reported the truth and described the reality as we see it. So no matter how bad it looks for the city or the Portland Police Bureau, we will report that. Um, Backing away just for a minute to the larger picture of our presentation tonight about compliance with the settlement agreement, uh, we see both good and bad trends. Uh, on the negative side, the city and the Portland Police Bureau have been slow to address the problems that robbed them of substantial compliance ratings in 2020, you know, after more than 6,000 use of force incidents during the protests. On a positive side, the city and the Department of Justice seem to have agreed on a set of remedies uh, that need to be implemented to achieve substantial compliance. They've been in negotiation for some time. Uh, in this third quarter report, we at least list for you the nine remedies that were being negotiated between the city and DOJ. And uh, you know, we intend to delve deeper into those each quarter as more progress is made in the negotiations. And as the city council, uh, after they've endorsed them and funded specific remedies. So, uh, we don't get into it much in this third quarter report, but more and more as we move forward, we'll, we'll be focusing on those because those are the remedies that are supposed to be the ones that move the city of Portland and the Portland Police Bureau back to substantial compliance. So let me give a, uh, let me turn this over to Tom now on use of force and then we'll, we'll start through the sections real quickly. Tom, if you wanna go ahead. Sure, thank you, sir. Um, so with respect to section three, the use of force, uh, there were some good things that occurred uh, during the third quarter. Uh, one of the things we took a sample of force events and we evaluated them for the reporting compliance with sections of the settlement agreement, as well as the reasonableness standards, uh, the Graham standards that need to be met for each use of force. Um, additionally, we had commented in prior reports of increasing uh, raw numbers of use of force as well as increasing force to custody rates. Uh, based on a recommendation by the COCOL, the PPB conducted a force evaluation um, looking to explain the rising force counts and the rising force rates. The results were that when you consider 2020, it's an atypical year. The force that was used more recently is similar to 2019. Um, there have been increases in high risk calls. So we were encouraged to see PPB be able to conduct this fulsome analysis. Um, one of the things that we're gonna look forward to is demonstrating an ongoing improvement loop, taking the, taking the assessment that was done and making sure that training reviews it, making sure the policy team reviews it, but to make sure it doesn't uh, just stop at the, at the creation of the report. Uh, as Dr. Rosenbaum uh, indicated though, there are still issues that persist with respect to section three. Uh, we continue to find process deficiencies uh, for the inspector review of uses of force. There has been an ongoing failure to correct the deficiencies from the 2020 protests. These include a critical incident assessment. Uh, this is only in the beginning stages. Uh, there have been no finalized updated policies. Currently, uh, we're, we're having policy review discussions, but it, it's still 2022 and no policies have been finalized. 
the PPB abandoned their plans for a force audit report, and it will now be a part of the critical incident assessment. And we discuss uh, in our report how that how PPB had conducted a training that did not include a comprehensive assessment of deficiencies. Um, and similarly, the updated training was insufficient uh, to return to substantial compliance. And I know Dr. Rosenbaum is gonna go into the, the training that was received. And so I'll pass it over to him for the moment. Okay, thanks, Tom. Hopefully I'm unmuted, I think. Uh, Basically, we continue the same evaluation standards for training as we've shown, uh, we had in the past, and they're shown here in this slide. Under needs assessment, uh, you know, the Bureau is expected to identify areas where officers are in need of additional training. And as we noted last quarter, they have done that in many areas, uh, but they still haven't done this on crowd control, specifically what did they learn from the 2020 protests. I know they're working on that. The training division has started an internal needs assessment on this matter, but it's not complete. More importantly, the city has yet to hire an outside organization as requested by COCOL and DOJ to conduct this critical assessment that Tom was just talking about of what went wrong during the protests. Uh, we've been very critical, frankly, of how force was managed by the Bureau during and after these pro demonstrations. And until those assessments are complete, we will continue to assign partial compliance for paragraph 79. In terms of high quality training, the, the Bureau must deliver, uh, develop and deliver high quality training that's responsive to these training needs, that's consistent with policy, and that's effective at strengthening constitutional policing on the streets of Portland. Uh, during the third quarter, uh, they delivered advanced academy of training for new officers, uh, in-service training on crowd control was delivered, I'll come back to that. Uh, peer intervention training, uh, and along with a series of online videos. So we focus our attention in this report on the crowd control training for the reasons that we've already mentioned today and that have been problematic in Portland for the last year and a half. I just mentioned that the peer intervention training is important there uh, to that, and, and we'll, we'll cover that more in our next report uh, because that's about uh, in teaching officers to intervene when their uh, peers are engaging and are about to engage in harmful action. And that can relate to crowd control as well. Um, they have these online videos as well that we cover in our report. You can read about them. There are 13 videos. I think generally they're good, uh, but they have to give officers enough time to, to watch all these videos. And that, that's a, something that the officers have been concerned about. And uh, they need to learn from them. And, and uh, we'd also like online training to be a little closer linked in some cases to scenario-based training, either virtually or in person, so they can translate these ideas they're getting in videos into real practice. Uh, staffing is really important, uh, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. In terms of evaluation systems, uh, PPB, they continue to evaluate the effectiveness of their training to improve future instruction. Uh, but I, you know, I'm always worried about the staffing here. They have one person that's really good, but you know, if she leaves, that there could be problems. Um, analysis reporting of force data, paragraph 86. You know, the bureau's still in substantial compliance here because the force inspector, um, you know, gathers the force data on a quarterly basis and examines patterns and trends, and then reports it to the chief and the training division and the training advisory council. Uh, they're, they're up to date on reporting that after they fell behind last quarter. Uh, documenting and reporting training, uh, paragraph 81, they remain in compliance there because the training division continues to use the learning management system or LMS to create and manage training records. But the LMS manager uh, left in the second quarter and uh, has not been replaced in the third or fourth quarter. So hopefully that personal, they have someone, they're working, hiring, and they're close to hiring. Uh, having that person starts. Uh, audit the overall training system. We have seen, we've been very patient waiting for another audit of training. Um, the Bureau's in compliance for now, but they need another formal audit of their training program in 2022. It's been three years since the last one, and I, we really believe that when the hiring of the new civilian leadership in the training uh, division that the chief referred to earlier tonight, uh, that 
that person could benefit enormously from having an audit that tells them what, uh, what the current conditions are. Um, if we go to the next one, Tom, um, this quality of the training delivered, you know, uh, given that the lingering effects of the problems and mismanagement around the protests, uh, the Bureau moved forward with crowd control training in the third quarter. And as a result, we gave particular attention to this in our, uh, in our evaluation uh, in September. I personally observed that training in person. Here are the takeaways. Uh, I felt it was well executed overall, but this is the crowd control training now. Uh, the instructors covered a lot of content, but there were several big problems, and here they are. There was too much material I felt covered in five hours. It made it difficult for anyone to completely digest this material and figure out how it could affect their actions during an actual protest. Um, there was no classroom or hands-on exercises or scenarios, and which is required by the settlement agreement. So PPV knew in advance, and we did, that that would not be granted substantial compliance for that reason alone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Bureau has yet to complete an internal or external critical assessment of crowd control problems. I think Tom mentioned that as, as well. Uh, but they did go ahead with the training anyway, which means that the trainers, you know, they don't, did not know the true frequency and severity of different problematic applications of force uh, or incomplete force reporting or by officers or incomplete after action reviews by supervisors. So the trainers were responsive to many of the issues raised by COCOL and DOJ, and I give them credit for that, but the problems we saw with the protests and managing protests uh, we don't have the complete picture, and that picture can only be gained by a comprehensive analysis of what actually transpired. And the last thing here, uh, they started the crowd control training before their force directive 1010 was finalized. So we've always recommended that training should uh, follow policy, and DOJ has been sharp uh, harping on this from day one. So including, uh, uh, there, there's a, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of policy issues related to the use of, of certain uh, weapons and certain units, such as the mobile field force. Um, uh, anyway, the, lastly, uh, I guess it's not on the chart there, it got cut off. Uh, procedural justice was not well integrated into the discussion of crowd control. The general message was, I felt, was that it's too difficult to engage in procedural justice in most crowd control situations. Um, let me turn it back to you uh, and we'll go from there. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Um, going to section five, community-based mental health services and going on to section six in a second on crisis intervention. These are the two sections that Dr. Rosenbaum had alluded to at the beginning as remaining still in substantial compliance. Um, we continue to look at the uh, the collaborative efforts um, between the Behavioral Health Unit Advisory Committee, uh, the Behavioral Health Coordination Team, the Unity Transportation Work Group, Legacy ED Community Outreach Group, um, and overall that we find that these groups are working together um, and that there's the city and PPB uh, actively participate in these groups. Additionally, the Unity Center continues to operate in accordance with the Memphis model. Um, in, our, in our last report, in our last presentation, we talked about Portland street response um, and how that was a, a, a new way of, of triage, triaging crisis response. Um, during the third quarter, we had we, the Bureau of Emergency Communications presented to the BHUAC on protocols and training. Um, the Portland street response themselves uh, presented to the BHUAC. There were some remaining questions for the PR, PSR representative. So there was a follow-up meeting scheduled and I believe that that is happening tomorrow. Um, one of the things that came up in the original, uh, in, in the initial presentation to the BHUAC was the notion that there was no oversight group for the Portland street response. So in our report, we recommended that the BHUAC be able to act as this oversight group. Um, moving along to the crisis intervention, uh, BOEX policies remain in effect. Uh, they also provided a refresher training during the third quarter. 
Uh, Portland PPB continues to train all officers uh, in crisis intervention. They receive 40 hours of CIT prior to graduating the Advanced Academy. And in November, uh, the PPB held an ECIT training for the enhanced uh, specialized response. And so we'll report more about that in our next report. Um, similarly, the Behavioral Health Unit Advisory Committee, they had two meetings during this third quarter, um, and they talked about a, a number of things. One of them was the BOEC training and the Portland Street response, as I uh, discussed earlier, as well as an overarching uh, approach to mental health response and what that means with the city. Um, there's also the service coordination team and the behavioral health response team. Both of these continue to operate consistent with what we've seen in prior quarters and what we found to be substantially compliant in prior quarters. With section eight, the employee information system, um, we continue to see issues persisting in this section as well. And similar to the fourth section, these are issues that we've identified in, in several reports and they, they continue to, to show themselves during each quarter. Um, so for instance, the, the EIS continues to have the potential for the data to be starved. We talked about how when force wasn't comprehensively reported, uh, that it starved the EIS system of the force data necessary to flag a potentially problematic officer. Uh, similarly, when officers haven't been held accountable or where no, no uh, accountability investiga or administrative investigation was opened up on them based on the protest use of force, the, the EIS data was starved. Was starved. These issues need to be identified through the comprehensive critical, uh, uh, critical incident assessment that we've been talking about and resolved so that future iterations of the EIS uh, will have the, the fulsome data that it needs. Um, we also continue to find issues with the manual alerts that are created by the force inspector. These are officers who have a higher rate of force or demonstrate some type of com higher comparative uh, use of force. However, when we've seen these being manually flagged by the force inspector, we've seen biasing language within the flag that may lead a supervisor to conclude that no intervention is necessary. In this report, we had found one officer who was responsible for 2.3% of all the force used throughout PPB in the quarter. The, there was no response by the RU manager and it, we have no evidence to show that this officer received any type of intervention. And again, these are things that we've identified in the past uh, that continued in this quarter. We also continue uh, to urge PPB and we, we've had initial meetings uh, this quarter with PPB in the city to conduct a, a comprehensive assessment of the EIS's effectiveness. PPB now has three years of alert data followed by one year of, of follow-up data that we can look at to see uh, effect. So we're looking to have this assessment include both process as well as outcomes. And like I said, we've had some initial conversations in the first quarter of this year, and we'll continue to, we'll continue to work on with PPB on conducting this assessment. Uh, going forward with accountability, again, issues that, that continue to have persisted across uh, a number of reports. There is still not meeting the 180 day timelines that were laid out in paragraph 121. We continue to see deficiencies in the operation of PRBs um, in terms of using the wrong, uh, using wrong definitions um, and, and not having the PRB represent a consistent uh, accountability system. We also talk in our report about the transition plan for the Rethink Police Accountability Commission. This commission was selected in July. However, they didn't have their first meeting until December. Um, all the while, IPR still remains the, uh, the civilian accountability uh, portion of PPB's accountability system. And there's still a, a sense of limbo with the IPR 
and uh, having having all of the resources and all the personnel needed to be that civilian component. Um, we also talk about allegations of force and whether they received a full allegation. Uh, in our in our prior two reports, we had talked about a supervisor who didn't forward a uh, complaint of excessive force for a full investigation. And the supervisor, that supervisor and all the supervisors who, uh, who approved that report, they haven't been held responsible. EIS entries were made for those supervisors. However, EIS is not an accountability uh, an accountability component. It should not be used for accountability. Similar to our use of force, however, we, we took a sample of accountability cases, looked at cases that were administratively closed, looked at supervisory investigations, uh, precinct referrals, and full investigations. And in reviewing this sample, we did find that there were reasonable investig investigative and uh, reasonable outcomes for that sample. Um, however, the requirement to resolve the above issues still remains for the accountability system. We also looked at officer-involved shootings and in-custody deaths. Our report talks about the steps that were taken in the aftermath of the event. We still will need to observe PRBs for some of the more recent critical events to look at how the PRBs determine in or out of policy, but also how they look at policy training and operational implications, even if the, even if the lethal force was in policy. Are there other things that the department can do to avoid similar situations in the future? So we're going to be looking at the PRBs for those OIS events. For the third quarter, we did, there was one OIS event where the witness officer was not interviewed on scene as required by policy and as required by the settlement agreement. We, we note in our report that this is a technical violation of the policy. However, the officer was interviewed within 24 hours and the reason the officer wasn't interviewed on scene was that the officer cited uh, experiencing emotional trauma. This was something that the detectives said that they hadn't uh, experienced um, from any officer involved in an OIS event. Uh, this was a sole event, and with respect to the with respect to the importance of officer well-being and officer and you know addressing officer trauma, we understood the decision, particularly since they were interviewed within 24 hours. However, in our report, we note that PPB doesn't have any protocols for determining this and for documenting this and what the follow-up would be. And so we, we recommend that PPB create those protocols, revise their policies so that there is some standardization if that were to occur. Like I said, though, this, this was a sole event. It hasn't happened in the past. It hasn't happened in any of the uh, OAS events since then but the protocols still need to be uh, developed. And I will pass it back on to Dr. Rosenbaum. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, this is our last section. We are in, uh, for all of you, the most important, because this covers PCEP and section nine is about community engagement and PCEP's role. Uh, many of you know more about this than I do. So I'm gonna summarize this. There's three angles on this one. We start with PCEP and then we talk about the city's role and then we talk about the police bureau's role. So um, first I just, um, you know, although PCEP has been through some difficult times and, and changes in membership and staffing, overall, we continue to be satisfied with the work. Um, first, I just wanna uh, thank Theo for his continuous support of PCEP and his work and wish him well in his new job and future endeavors because uh, I've enjoyed uh, working with him. Um, and I know you will probably say more about that later. Um, you know, PCEP, can, you guys continue to meet regularly and support multiple subcommittees, including your youth, behavioral health, racial equity, the settlement agreement, policy subcommittee, and all continuing to work hard as you even described earlier in this meeting. Um, you know, you approved in the third quarter three recommendations. Uh, although the city had not formally responded to them by the end of the quarter, we'll follow up with that in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, you've solicited input from community members and organizations and government officials 
I won't detail that work here, but you have been very active, in including meetings with city council on core patrol services and uh, police street response that occurred in the third quarter. Also, uh, you know, a growing concern about racial equity issues. Um, and you know, PSEP continues to be represent to represent a reasonably broad spectrum of the community, which is required by the settlement agreement as well. You, some of your leaders have stepped down, but the steering committee, it seems, has stepped up to provide leadership for PSEP here. So for the third quarter, we're satisfied that the progress made by PSEP in fulfilling its obligation under the settlement agreement, although it could use some more consistent support from the city. And that's the next slide. I want to talk about the city role. Um, Tom, if you can switch that. Um, turning to the city's role, during the third quarter, it's fair to say that the city continued to work with PSEP in many ways. The staff continued to manage meetings and provide technical support. And also the police bureau and city officials consistently attended PSEP meetings as they have tonight, some, most of them, <laughs> to answer uh, any questions that may arise about the Portland Police Bureau or other matters. Um, however, the problems with posting written minutes, especially this for the subcommittees, continued in the third quarter. Uh, we don't have to go into the details now. But, so consequently, the city was unable to return to substantial compliance for paragraph 114 in the third quarter. The problem here is the city experienced some repeated turnovers in positions uh, responsible for PSEP. Um, with more consistent support though from the city, the public I think can be kept up to date on the important work being done by PSEP members and their subcommittee. Uh, finally, the city uh, must be very attentive to the problem of turnover with any group of volunteers filling those positions in a timely manner is essential. And I see that you're working on that tonight actually and, and planning to work ahead on that with the steering committee. And that's good to hear. On uh, the next slide here, Tom, if we can go on to the role of the police bureau. Uh, in terms of PPB's role in community engagement during the third quarter, their Office of Community Engagement, you know, continued to implement the four components of their community engagement plan, which is public involvement, communication, access, and training. And our report provides details of that. Uh, the Bureau continued to work with its advisory councils, both what they call operational advisory councils and community cultural specific groups, um, some of those of which Tom has already discussed. Uh, we continue to encourage the Bureau's community culturally specific advisory groups to share more information about their meetings, whether they be agendas, minutes, or summaries of recommendations. Um, you know, apparently I've learned they're not required by law to do that. Uh, and I understand that some groups are seeking sort of a private space to discuss their issues, and that makes sense. But I, but the support is being provided for these groups by the Portland Police Bureau, a government agency, and some level of reporting would be appreciated by the public, I think. Uh, next slide here, Tom, uh, the annual report, the Bureau is expected, required to submit an annual report, share that with PSEP and present it to the city council and then have three precinct meetings so the community can hear about it and comment. In the past, that did not happen, but we are pleased to report that in the third quarter, the Bureau was able to achieve this requirement and thus returning to substantial compliance for paragraph 150. Indeed, we found that the precinct meetings with the community members in these uh, three precincts, they did discuss the required topics, including the Bureau's approach to traffic stops and bias-free policing. And speaking of traffic stops, let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, we, they continue to prepare quarterly and annual reports on traffic stops and use of force with breakdowns by race and gender as required by paragraph 148. Uh, about 1% of the stops involved individuals that the officers perceived having a mental health issue. Uh, the third quarter data uh, continues to show racial disparities in who the officers are stopping. If we go to the next slide, uh, these are the disparities that I put this table together for. It's a breakdown of traffic stops in each precinct during the third quarter for black African-American drivers. In our report, uh, I looked at traffic stops um, for all three quarters of 2021. I only show here the third quarter to kind of keep it simple and easy to read. Although we found a slight improvement in disparities over time throughout 2021, all three of the precincts continue to show pretty sizable disparities and the central and east precincts exhibit the largest disparities as you can see here in yellow. For example, Blacks make up only about 2.9% of the central precinct population 
but 13.6% of all stops in that, in that precinct. And similar pattern in the East precinct, uh, only 5% of the population, but 20% of the stops. Uh, Tom, if we go to the next slide, I've decided this time to look at uh, the Hispanic Latino disparities uh, because they make up a significant, they make up 10% of the Portland population. Uh, as you can see there, the disparities are much smaller than we saw for the Black African American community. Uh, only the central district is noteworthy here in yellow. The Hispanic Latinos make up 6% of the population, but 11% of stops. The others are pretty even. All right, so putting this all in context, well, um, I want to say that disparities per se do not represent a compliance issue given the way the settlement agreement is structured. Uh, however, the Bureau is required to discuss stops and bias free policing issues with the community at these precinct meetings. And we encourage uh, the Bureau and PSEP and others to continue this dialogue and identify troubling patterns and propose solutions. Thank you. So that ends our presentation. Let me open it up for questions and comments from PSEP members and then the community. First, I just want to say, though, to remind everyone, if you have any comments on our report that you don't uh, make tonight, uh, you still have until February 17th to give us feedback. So as you can see from the slide there, uh, that's how you can give us feedback uh, to our email um, and uh, by the 17th. Also, you know, don't forget, uh, if you haven't already, to take the short survey on body-worn cameras. If you missed the meeting the other night, um, we have to, you have till the end of the month, but that's only about a week, to post uh, to um, go to the survey. And did anyone put that in the chat? I guess I can put the link in the chat. Uh, oh, Nia just put it there. Thank you. Uh, Nia Franco on our team. So if you, there's the link to the survey in the chat. If you, uh, it takes less than five minutes. The average person's taking four and a half, four minutes. I've already looked at that. So it's, uh, it's, uh, please do that. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn this back now to the people running the show here and, uh, and uh, open it up for us. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dennis. So we'll start with Anne and then I see Celeste hand is up. Uh, thank you, Dennis and Tom, for that presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I will say overall, I'm disheartened by this information and the, the troubling news in many areas. Uh, I've been a PSEP member, it'll be two years in March. Uh, a question I have is uh, the critical assessment of crowd control. Um, that has been a continuing issue. And I'm wondering, since it hasn't been addressed um, continually, what, I mean, what can we do about it as a community, as a member of the community? I'm very concerned on many levels about that. Yes, uh, it has been a while and, um... So I think, uh, and I'm not the one to best summarize. I don't know if the city wants to summarize. They have made some progress lately. I don't know if Heidi or Mary Claire wants to say that they have uh, putting out an RFP, I believe. Do you want to respond to that real quickly? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. So Heidi Brown, City of Portland, City Attorney's Office, um, she, her pronouns. Um, so we are in the um, final process of our office selecting a um, a group uh, that a group to perform the critical assessment. Um, we have sent over information to the Department of Justice because part of what we've agreed to in the additional remedies, and although those are not yet a court order, we are pursuing several of those like the dean position as discussed earlier um, and so the we are hiring an outside entity to perform this critical assessment of 2020 and they will be people who have done monitoring and assessments of other cities and who are under consent decrees or settlement agreements and who have had protests and issues with protests so um so so we are toward the end of that process and hope to have somebody in in the next month or so at the latest. Um, and then that process will begin and the critical assessment will move forward. But we have been 
waiting to have this outside entity perform the critical assessment of the 2020 protests, since that was part of what the um, the addendum, the, the new settlement agreement terms, what we've been discussing with the Department of Justice as far as a remedy for um, some of the issues that came up in 2020. Um, I just wanna ask, thank you for that. Uh, but, uh, and I appreciate that, but it is 2022, over 6,000 incidents of excessive use of force uh, during 2020. I'm just wondering, um, as a community member, uh, how come it's taken so long to get this together? You, you uh, say that you're doing it due to the new agreements of remedies that the DOJ has put forth, but this has been two years. Those remedies that you're speaking of are just most recent ones. So if you could uh, respond to that, I'd appreciate it. Well, I would note, and that we received the notice in April, and so we've been working since then as far as figuring out what, uh, remedies, and we received the DOJ's pr proposed remedies in, I think, May. Um, so we have been talking about those for quite a while. As far as why the city didn't do it, I will tell you that trying to figure out how to analyze um, 6,400 uses of force um, what do you do? Do you do a percentage of them? Um, the, the, the police bureau went through some various ideas of how to do it. And ultimately at the point when, and, and actually started um, one process and recognized that literally with the staffing issues that they have, it was gonna take, um, I think a couple of years before they would be getting through everything. Um, and I think at that point when it was, when we re realized how long it was going to take, it made more sense. We were already um, in the process of looking at hiring an outside entity to do it. And so then we just finished going through that process. Um, and, thank and thank I you. Will, hey, go ahead. I just want to respond to Anne real quickly too. The, the Bureau and the city, the Bureau did actually write a report uh, after the protests but we were very disappointed in that report. And so was DOJ. And we wrote that in one of our previous reports that we felt it wasn't really critical enough. It was sort of, you know, we did a good job kind of thing, but we did the best right. we could. And so it, that, that, that's part of the delay is that we came back and said, no, that's not good enough. Then this whole other process started. But anyway, I wanted to add that. But that doesn't, that doesn't, that, that doesn't get to the point of, you know, I mean, I, I remember there was talk about best practices. Let's learn from some of these issues. And, and it's two years later. I'll, I'll let others talk. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Appreciate it. Um, Celeste, and then it'll be Gloria, Amy, and Zainab. Hi, uh, Judith, I threw a question in there for Dennis, but I have a couple of other questions as well. Uh, with, with, and Heidi, you may have to join in as well, but with regard to trying to analyze this large amount of use of force uh, data, are there some best practices or other guides we might be able to use to determine which works best or a willingness to use a hybrid or dual? Uh, metrics. Is that a possibility? That is a good question. Um, I mean, I think at this point, the hope is that, um, you know, we came up with a scope of work for the outside entity for how they would do it and um, worked through that with Department of Justice. And that, and, and so that's what's going to guide it. And that was, I think, framed in part, like we originally got the scope of work from the Department of Justice. So I think that was framed in part by DOJ talking to other jurisdictions who had done, um, you know, uh, uh, assessments of their protest events. Um, you know, frankly, nobody had the volume and length of protest events that Portland had. Um, it, it, you know, so this was, so there's, there's some novelty to that, that we're trying to, trying to figure out. I think what we're looking at is they'll do some random sampling and percentages um, to try to get some sense of the big picture of what was going on. And, and hopefully we will get, um, you know, that's the whole point of doing that, that assessment and doing it with an outside entity. I, I hope that that will provide greater, um, you know, community trust in the outcome that I know there's been questions about the police policing the police. 
um, and and that this way this will be a way for hopefully to address that concern. Okay, thank you. And then my other question, uh, this might be for Dennis, maybe Tom, but with regard to um, the procedural justice failures, uh, and I know I'm not being generous with that, but that's the way it sounded. Um, what was the time frame of this, this assessment? And did it coincide with the chief's directives to, um, to change what type of stops you would make? I'm just curious if there's any kind of causal or correlative relationship between the fact that we've had a lot of procedural justice lapses, and then we were trying to reduce the possibility of uh, motorists um, having uh, problematic stops by the chief saying, let's not stop for things that are not urgent, such as uh, expired tags or broken brake lights, et cetera. So I'm just wondering, what was the time period for that? Yeah, I, I, uh, Celeste, I, oh, this nice. Yeah, I don't think there's a connection. I don't know for sure. Uh, the, the, the training I observed was in September. Uh, I believe that his uh, uh, response was before that. Uh, I do think what they're suggesting there is a good idea in that, uh, you know, locally and nationwide, I see this where there's just you know aggressive stops and they tend to be this uh, desperate by race and neighborhood and um, and and making sure that there there's really a serious uh, incident going on. Now the problem with procedural justice and, and, and granted the procedural justice is really critical in those incidents that you're talking about. So I understand where you're coming from. Uh, but I think here what has happened the, after the uh, protests and ever since then, the, the, the bureaus had its own morale problem, right? I mean, a lot of officers feel, as we said in our report, feel that they were being picked on uh, by various officials and all of us. Uh, and so they, they focused on internal procedural justice. And that is a legitimate thing, which is that uh, how are you being treated by your supervisors, by your your employee, your work environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the too much, I mean, there wasn't, th that took up the time that what could have also been spent on external procedure of justice. How are you treating members of the community? And I think they're both important, but I think in, in this case on the crowd control and also with crowd control, there's kind of this feeling that, gosh, you know, people are yelling at you and stuff. There's nothing you can do to be nice to them. Well, that's not really true. You know, and even procedural justice applies even when you're uh, when you're arresting someone, you know, how are you treating them? So uh, it, it really is a broader discussion. And I just think, and, and Portland's had it in their uh, uh, training uh, materials for several years. We've been pushing this from 2015, um, mm -hmm. but it sometimes gets pushed aside. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Gloria? Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to have to leave it on. <laughs> or it switches off by itself. Okay, my question was regarding the quality of training report that went to the police department where Dennis, you talked about too much material covered no classroom hands-on scenario. Training started before the internal or external assessment on crowd control was completed and before the force directive of 1010 was finalized. I want to know, even with your recommendations, the Portland Police Bureau still moved ahead with their training and did you get any kind of feedback as to why the quality of training report wasn't taken into consideration? We might not be having this conversation about um, the faulty training that has gone on now. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. I think if you put this all back in historical perspective, uh, Kokel and DOJ were kind of saying back in early part of 2021, mm -hmm. uh, you need to get your crowd control stuff in order so that you can provide training in the summer. We were kind of pushing them to, you're gonna, you could have another summer like you did in 2021, like you did in 2020. And so uh, I think that's partly why they went ahead saying something is better than nothing, but they knew that it wasn't good enough. Uh, so, I mean, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to justify it. I'm trying to explain what happened, uh, but we, they, they knew that it wasn't gonna be good enough and we did too. So, uh, but yeah, I think the other stuff, that was a special unit. I mean, we're gonna talk about that soon when we stop talking here, but uh, that was the rapid response team, that training that you wanna talk about tonight. And that, that uh, you know, is something, well, I, I'll save my comments for later on that. Okay. But yeah, you're bringing up good points. And if I if I could add to that, um, Gloria, in response to your question, um, so what, this training was originally scheduled for June. It it um, in reviewing the training materials with the DOJ and the COCOL, um, we found that were, there were more edits that needed to be done to the lesson plans, and it got bumped to July. Then in July, the RRT resigned, and the original setup for that training was that the morning would be classroom training and the afternoon would be scenario training, as is normally what we normally do as part of um, you know as part of the settlement agreement, but just part of best practices at this point. And RRT was part of the, you know, they were part of the people that were going to help with the scenario since they were the most involved. When they all resigned, that was no longer an option. The training then got bumped out to September. But I will say that all along, the city's position was that DOJ and COCOL had already identified and the city and PPB, there had been issues already identified that were critical that needed to be addressed. And rather than, and DOJ and the COCO were saying, you need to do this full assessment before you do training. And we, we insisted that we move forward, at least train on the issues we know are problems, understanding that yes, of course there are, we need a larger assessment. We need to know more of what happened and what went wrong and what we can do better. And once we have that full assessment, we will, we will train again and add in the rest of that. So I just wanted to kind of clarify at least my recollection of how this all occurred and how, how we got from point A to point B of why the September training, it was limited, but it was limited to at least address what we already knew was a problem. Thank you. Thank you. And so now, Amy, it's your turn. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, as I'm sitting here thinking about numbers and statistics and data, I kind of um, am curious, has any of the uh, 6,500 documents been like separated into multiple reports by one person? Or are we saying that there were individual events at that volume number? That, that's kind of been my question is how many of them were from the same person? In terms of the same person, uh, so if you have two different evenings and the same officer uses force on two different evenings, that would require two different uh, FDCRs. Uh, so there's out of the 6,000, there certainly would be overlap in terms of one officer using force across multiple evenings. Is that, is that what you're asking, Amy? Um, boy, that's good. That's something I hadn't considered, but actually it was about the individuals reporting that they have been assaulted or hurt or the ones, you know, that were attacked, were they reporting yeah, now it could be different nights. You know, you added something I hadn't even thought about. It's like, was the same individual at all three events or four events or whatever, and then filed a report because they somehow got hurt or had violence put on them. I'm just looking for multiples. You know, how many of them are duplications? How many of them are single events? Because to me, that's really important. Yeah, if, if the same person filed multiple multiple complaints uh, over the course of different evenings, 
uh, that would be information that uh, IPR would have or IA would have in, in the AIM system. Uh, I don't believe that, well, I know we haven't done that analysis to see whether one person would file multiple complaints, um, but it, I, I believe the data exists to be able to do that analysis. Yeah, because I think it would show, it would change the dynamic of your large number to me and make it more, a little more realistic about what you know, how many people were actually involved and how many officers were doing it on multiple days. You know, that's really important too, is to get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah. Thank you. And that these, was my question. And Amy, those are, those are things I think we are looking to see in the, uh, in the after action assessment and that, that PPB had done. They weren't present in the initial after action that was done. Those are things that I think would would fall into the upcoming critical assessment, uh, things things like that. Excellent, thank you. I'll thank look forward you. to reading it. Thank you. Zainab. Thank you. Um, I'll have, I have a lot of questions and thoughts um, regarding your presentation, um, Rosenbaum and the team and about COCO um, report. I do have questions about the um, piece up piece as well, because there was something that um, I re recall about minutes um, being a directive from DOJ or a, Judith, do you remember um, when I asked about minutes and you said that DOJ? Um, I did. And um, mm -hmm. I remember what I said, what I believe was that when the mayor's office asked the piece up to take on um, the Port Patrol Services and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which were two additional um, busy committees that we had fallen um, out on our, um, uh, we were having trouble keeping up with the minutes. So we asked if getting transcripts was an acceptable, um, an acceptable alternative. I had a conversation with Jared about that. He had said he thought it was, but we are now you know, now it's decided that we should be doing very simple minutes as well. So that was what the conversation was. But the during that period of time, the three the the time that is being evaluated here, you know, that was what we were trying to do as an alternative. We have definitely had a hard time keeping up with minutes. Yes, and so that's um, one of the things that I would say because I did not have any minutes for my subcommittee meeting, so I was not able to really give a thorough report out. Um, and also, I did not find the video um, online. So I also understand how this, the Office of Equity and Human Rights Department or division is stretched um, thin. But I would really like to understand more about COCO's um, synthesizing of data and how do you synthesize data uh, without talking or have you talked with PSAP members? Perhaps you have. I know I haven't um, had a meeting. Um, so, but let me ask the question that I really want to get to, um, and this is for Dennis um, Rosabombs and the Cocos team, and I'll put it in the um, chat once I'm finished. And there's a lot of questions here. When you say that you are that you, as Coco, are independent from the city or DOJ, Department of Justice, who selected your contract? Uh, you'd have to ask the city that. It was the city of. Portland that selected that, uh, I believe, yes. Okay. How or who pays for the contract? Uh, the city of Portland, but they have no control over what we do. Okay. The discovery of the 2018 um, rapid response training PowerPoints um, in a report from COCO, um, the team learned in 2018, and so I've since this release on January 14th from the city's mayor office. And I'm really, again, I'm gonna ask again, if the, yeah. there's anyone represented from the, city's, the city and the mayor's office, um, please speak um, to this, but very disappointed um, that they haven't been, um, or haven't been in, in the meeting. Um, there's on page 18 of this report um, that in 2017, training was not added to the learning management system. That's what would you put in there, in that report. And so you were in 2018, but you noticed, the COCO team noticed that there were some 2000 training that was not added to the learning management system. And that all the training 
were to be added and updated in the learning management system. And I'm gonna read, sorry, I'm just trying my best to. Whew. You're reading a 2018 report. Yes, I am. PB, okay, PBB's COCO assessment, electronic okay. tracking of training, sure. COCO assessment. PBB's new learning management system is the Bureau's response to the requirement in paragraph 81 that the training division is electronically tracking, maintaining, and reporting complete and accurate records, that's quotes, relevant to training. How many hours of training does the police are required by the police? Are, are required by the police department is a chief Lavelle question is I'm not sure who can answer this question, but how many hours of training does a new um, officer get and those who are currently um, working as officers. I'll let the bureau answer that. Yeah, I don't know the exact number of hours per se, but the, initially when you get hired, you go to the basic academy. And that's about 16 weeks. Then you come back and you get about 12 weeks of advanced academy um, at PPB. And then once you're done with that, uh, you go into like a maintenance kind of yearly uh, training, but it's broken down by type of training. So you need so many hours of use of force training over a three-year period, so many hours of leadership, so many hours of uh, control holes or law, and it kind of uh, goes in chunks, like uh, three-year chunks. And we usually achieve that training requirement by doing in-service. So we'll make sure officers are scheduled to go every year to in-service, and then we build out the training to meet those requirements. So is that like an average of like, can you give an average of how many hours of training a person should be expected to re or required to take within a year? Um, it's not a yearly requirement, but I would say just, you know, it's a, kind of in three year chunks, but just say a hundred for the sake of, of round numbers. Okay. And so this goes back to um, having a clear picture for reporting since 2018. How can the COCO reports be held to accurate and transparent data synthesizing with the trust and integrity community require for relationship building? How will COCO follow up with the internal affairs related to the investigation that we're going to talk about with the PowerPoints? And then how many Portland release of record request forms have been formally completed by Rosenbaum and Associates as a COCO since 2015? And that's the, that question you can, if you can answer first. Uh, your, how many release of records? Mm -hmm. Release of record requests. So how, how do you get your records? How do you, how did you, how, cause I'm trying to figure out how did, how was it missed? So you noticed in 2018 that in 2000, there was some 2017 training not added to the LMS system. Um, so you noticed that, but how did you know if there was not others that were missing or, and I'm trying to figure out how did you start monitoring the training? Did you get a list of all the trainings required? And then from there, you started monitoring from there, what was added, what was new, what was you know taken off? I mean, oh. how, how is this process? Yeah, well, we get the training. We, we get a list every year of the scheduled trainings. And when I was in Portland, we sat down on the computer and looked at the LMS uh, listings back in that time and noticed that there were a few that were not there. We've checked since then and they pretty much all have been there. However, my point would be, uh, I don't know exactly, uh, Zina, what you, where you're going with this, but uh, mm -hmm. this issue of, of should we have noticed that uh, there was something screwed up in 2018? Is that what you're suggesting? I can respond to that if you'd like me to. Well, I mean, you can answer that question for, um, but I guess, um, screwed up, whatever that, whatever words you use. But what I'm asking right now is about the 2018 training that we're going to talk about. Those modules, PowerPoints. Because one thing I didn't notice in any of your reports was you have, you looked at PowerPoints. I saw that you looked at scenarios. I saw that you looked at videos, but I never oh, no. saw that your team looked at 
PowerPoints. And oh, so yeah. where we, are PowerPoints, okay. where are PowerPoints kept? Is it kept in the LMS? Is everything yeah. kept in this LMS system? Yeah. No. And have you been tracking this system since your yeah, inception tracking, of, in this process? Yeah. So I, I spent 30 years teaching PhD students how to do research. So I know a lot about how to collect data. Uh, and so I we've tracked this data from day one when we started here and we've requested lots of data. We've re, I, Our reports clearly say that we do look at PowerPoints and we've looked at PowerPoints every quarter since we started. And those are lesson plans. And let me just be clear about the issue with this. So now that we're moving on to this other topic, um, the, uh, we did not know about this, but I'll, I'll, I'll back up and say, we have focused on the core training. There's, as the chief kind of implied, there's so many different aspects to training, but we focused on the main training for recruits, for in-service, for everybody, for crisis intervention training. The point being that there, this special unit, RRT, rapid response, they have had, and other special units, have had all kinds of other trainings, many of which aren't even at the training academy. They're somewhere else. Uh, and those are not as well documented or supervised. That's my opinion. And we did not pay attention to those for a couple of years because nobody, it was off the, off the record, but off the chart. But the point being, as soon as the screw up in 2020, we started asking, I'm going to, well, let's keep an eye on those. We asked for those PowerPoints. We asked for that. And if you look at our report, previous reports, you'll see that we said the city started training RRT and they did a horrible job. And we weren't happy. This is before any of this came out. We yeah, found out um, about this thank, last week. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Dennis. And okay. thank you for that. Yeah. It's unfortunate as a volunteer, I've had to go back through all your reports since 2015 just to see what's been going on. I don't know if that's really my role, but apparently I I felt the need to do that. Um, and so I don't have a lot of time because I don't want to take other people's time in this conversation as well. Um, but there are some concerns. It is not just about training, but that's what we're talking about right now that I know I have been talking about it. I know um, my colleague Ann Campbell has been talking about it, especially during our settlement agreement and policy mm -hmm. um, committee meetings, subcommittee meetings. Um, and the concern I have, again, is the trust and integrity of the reports. Since right, then. whether you trust Okay, since report. 2018. That's mm -hmm. the trust. And I'm, it's not about you. It's about what information you were not getting given. Okay. And mm -hmm. so how can we trust the integrity and trust the, um, for the community to help rebuild this already um, fractured um, relationship? And so um, I, I know, I again, <laughs> that I've listened to your reports since you've been giving them every quarter. And I know I'll, I'll continue to be um, a person who really wants to understand, but you know, it's about now accountability of everyone. Um, and it's not just the Portland Police Bureau. Um, I unfortunately, the mayor is not here. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's leadership. Um, it's also um, integrity when it comes to transparent information. Um, and uh, Heidi, I'm going to put you in here. <laughs> you know, when we when we when I learned that you know you have 180 days to really comply with the settlement agreement. Um, it made me wonder um, about what other information we're not hearing about. And so I, I just really want this to resonate that um, for, for those communities who have always had an issue, um, this continues to be a stronger issue because of these type of things. And so yes, COCO, um, DOJ, um, Everyone who has been monitoring and, and, and looking through this and working on this, I know it sounds, I've seen through the um, 2020, where the, Port, the Portland, City of Portland and the Police Bureau had actually met the all of the substantial compliance based on DOJ and to learn only six months later, they fell out of compliance. And so I go back to the history. In 2016, there was a three-day riot what was learned from that riot so that they can learn and prepare for the 2020 riot, okay? Um, I know riots are not new. <laughs> and so when we're talking about training and talking about um, you know, measurement and understanding, you know, understanding the history 
and recognizing that we're not um, moving away from that. Um, but I know there's been countless of report, countless of articles, countless of studies, countless of countless of information um, that you can find. And I will get into this later, um, especially when I ask the question about the police bureau, um, because you know, on your website, Chief Lavelle, um, to join, it says that there's only 40 hours required for training. I really appreciate where you're going with this. Um, and I do wanna make sure we're getting, um, we're going long on this part of the agenda. I know a lot of people have come tonight specifically to hear about the issue with the slides. Um, so I, I did wanna um, maybe recommend that, the, that you invite um, Dennis and Tom to come to have these more detailed um, dig in conversations about the statistics and things that are beyond the, the quarterly report to a, to a settlement agreement um, meeting, which hopefully they would be willing to do so that to get more into that with you. Um, I am gonna turn to some public comment time because we always do that. I'm gonna be very tightly managing this so that we can get to the time to talk about the slide deck. So the, the questions are directly, please keep them directly related to the COCO report. And um, I'm gonna call on Patrick and then Dan. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi Tom, uh, hi Dennis. I, uh, w I was chopping in and out earlier, uh, having some lag problems, but one thing I heard that was really important to me and I wanted to make sure I got this right, uh, Tom mentioned that the BHUAC was probably the uh, place that you wish to place the PSR, and the public, uh, Portland Street response. And I wanted to ask, you do realize that this is the BHUAC that is not a public meeting and that it doesn't, it is not publicly accessible. Could Tom or Dennis speak to that? Yeah, Patrick. And, oh, wait, sorry. I, I'm sorry. Uh, also, I wanted to make sure uh, there was a question much earlier, and I wanted to make sure it, get, it got answered because it's directly affecting my life. And that was uh, the one I'm posting it in after my question. Thank you. Okay, and I don't know what that is, but we're going to only do one question at a time right now um, because the chat is moving too quickly for me to keep track of the questions as I've asked people okay. to please use it sparingly. So can you okay. answer Patrick's question um, that we hear wait. from Dan? Um, just, a, just a moment. Yeah. I would rather have the other question answered than my question because it's more significant. Uh, Is it the I one think, from Ilsa? Yeah, I think it's significant. Okay, I, that yeah, I, uh, I'm going to call on that. So, I'm going to take care of that too. Thanks, okay. Patrick, for caring okay. about that. So, can you um, answer um, the Patrick's question? Then we'll hear from Dan, and then I'm will either read Ilsa's quest, uh, question or ask if she would like to read it. I've been talking to her. Sure, Patrick. Yours was on uh, BHUAC uh, being the oversight for uh, for PSR, correct, sir? Yes. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that the BHUAC was reflected in their minutes is there is a lack of an oversight board for the PSR. Um, currently, the BHUAC has a structure. It has the subject matter expertise. Um, it has things set in place. I understand there's uh, there's, there's been historic uh, questions about whether the BHUAC should be open to the public. I know that they have taken steps to be a bit more transparent by having public meetings. Uh, they, they post their minutes online. I, I understand your question. I, I think the reason that we're, we're talking about the BHUAC as being uh, that over that overseeing or potential overseeing of the PSR is because the structure exists. Um, and again, it's a mental health advisory committee that it, it's directly related to the, the delivery of services that PSR would do. Um, I, I don't think from the COCAL standpoint that we would object to a new oversight board being created. I, I just know that that was one of the concerns of the BHUAC was that there was no current oversight or, uh, or advisory board. Thank you. Um, Dan. All right. Well, you say one question. How much time can I take to ask the question? Well, time you myself. can take time. Just I would remind people that a lot of people came to have the other conversation as well. So, you know, um, 
that's all I'm, I'm, I... I'm going to set it for, for two minutes and I'll, I'll do as much as I can. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, so uh, I just want to echo what Patrick was just talking about. Uh, in addition to what he said, the PSR is a fire bureau program, not a police bureau program. So it really shouldn't be under a police bureau advisory council or, or commission uh, or committee. Uh, they keep calling themselves a council, but that's not what they're called. Um, the, uh, the PCCP should have had a chance to look at the RFP that went out that apparently has already gone out. Is there, there's almost been somebody decided on it to review this uses of force. I don't remember a PCCP having a chance to look at that. Um, the um, employee information system, you know, if they tra it tracks how many times an officer used force within a six month period to see if they went outside these ranges. And if, as uh, co-chair Campbell said, if, if these things happened two years ago, the EIS, even if it's filled out, isn't going to worry about that because it happened so long ago. Um, uh, I, I think, too, you know, just leading to the next discussion, there are other slides in that slide deck that are pro as, almost as problematic as the derogatory one I know we're going to talk about. And I want to make sure that the compliance officer, when they're reviewing these trainings, is looking for this kind of these biases against political beliefs and uh, biases that refer to protest as a mess and things like that. So I think that's an another, you know, let's not just focus on that one slide. And so uh, here is uh, my question to sum this up. Um, so uh, you were talking about how the police review board used incorrect standards at some of their meetings and then talked about how citizen review committee needs to learn more about how the police do their work. Were you, tying those two things together because it sounded like the other six members of the board who aren't CRC members were the ones making the mistakes. And it makes it sound as if you're saying the citizen review committee uh, caused the problems. And I just want to make sure that's not what you're saying. No, I, I don't think that we're saying that the citizen review committee uh, representatives on the PRBs are, are where the, the only issues lie. Um, Again, we, we, we talk about these issues from the PRBs that have that have been uh, consistent over the last couple of quarters. It's not it's not solely related to the CRC members who are acting as, as community uh, voting members. Okay, and um, Dan will carry forward. Um, so I am going to read the question, which I'm going to, for the 500th time, try to get back to that Ilsa put in. She doesn't have a microphone. So if everyone, please don't type anything right now, um, because every time it happens, it spins out of my control. Um, and Ilsa's question is um, that, I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned that 1% of the contacts were people with mental health where were people with men with I'm assuming that noticeable mental health issues. Two years ago, the city police said that 50% of their contacts were people were people who were homeless. Can you give any sort of guess what percentage of people who are homeless are having mental health issues? I, I believe well, the one. Oh, go ahead, Dennis. Well, I. I don't know about Portland, but I think there are some statistics I've seen elsewhere about 25%, but it could be 25 to 50%. It's pretty high. Mm -hmm. I believe the 1% that was being referred to though were traffic stops. And so it didn't, it, it yeah. wasn't street stops of, of the homeless and persons with mental illness. Um, and again, the, the, question, the question isn't so much what percent of, of people who are homeless also have a corresponding mental health uh, or mental illness, where, where PPB interactions occurs, where there's going to be a mental health crisis. Um, and so that's to separate out those two. I, I don't know that, I don't know how many, I don't have the information right on hand in terms of persons in mental health crisis who are homeless at the time that, uh, that officers engage with them. Um, I do know that there is, I believe it's about 12% of, of calls, 12 to 15% of the PPB calls have some type, uh, some mental health component based on the mental health template report that gets filled out for, for every call that has a mental health component. 
Do they also have a tick mark on foot stops as well? What percentage of those are mental health? I don't know with, with foot stops, Dennis, if you know. No, I think they do have that though, I, uh, but it's a very small number of foot stops. So 90 some percent of all their stops are traffic stops. So, uh, so that's a smaller number. However, the, the houseless problem is more substantial given that you know roughly half of their arrests are in that category. So, but that's a whole other issue. Thank you. Um... Dennis, um, and the, the pedestrian stops, those are not a part of the settlement agreement. Is that correct or not correct? Well, there, it depends on how you interpret it. I mean, keeping the data is part of the settlement agreement. Uh, uh, reducing disparities was not originally part of the way it was constructed. It was, it was more about pattern and practice with uh, persons uh, with mental illness. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting. But we've, as you know, and uh, the city, I'm sure, maybe not, doesn't want, like me doing this, but I, I report on racial and ethnic disparities because uh, it's related in the sense that they're required to collect that data. And I'm encouraging others to, uh, to make sure that uh, those disparities are justified. And thank you. And I'll just remind folks that the PSEP, um, which was a replacement for the COAB, um, is charged with going about um, going <clears throat> further um, than, the, than just the settlement agreement. So issues that are coming up in the chat are things that can be brought to the PSEP. Um, okay, Zainab, is it quick? Because we've got, okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Talking about the stops data collection, is that part of COCOL's also what you, you do to monitor the reports um, that come out of the um, police bureau about stops data collection? Do you also, is that part of your COCOL re, uh, it, I don't know, it's, it's synthesized data? I can't say you're not a monitor, so I'm not sure how you, your compliance. Yeah. Our, we feel it's our job to make sure they're collecting that data and doing a good yeah. job of it. Portland actually is, they have some pretty good analysts there, better than, than a lot of other departments. Uh, so they yeah. are collecting it, they are managing it. It's a matter of what's being done about. It. That's a different issue. And I also want to add what's missing from the data is why people are getting stopped. And so while I know this is what is collected, so it's what I see that they have a lot about the race, and but why people are getting stopped is not part of these reports. And that's what I, I find that's missing. I'm not sure if you believe that's missing, um, Dennis, um, but, but I find that to be um, something that I really like to know why people are getting stopped. And that should be a part yeah. of, since they, do collect, since they do collect this data. Yeah, absolutely. They have started collecting data and, and are getting officers to record. There's a stop app now that where they have to record the reason for the stop. And that's somewhat new, I think January of this past year. Uh, we're still, the, the, is not reporting on, on that yet though, to my knowledge. Well, we can check into that. Thank uh, you. But, but they are, there's also supposed to be cards they pass out in five languages reminding people that they uh, have the right not to be searched and that sort of thing. And that, that hasn't happened yet. Thank you, Dennis, for that. Um, really appreciate this conversation. I hope you will be willing to come back and go if if um, Zainab invites you to come to the subcommittee. There's Absolutely. a lot, obviously, to dig into. Um, and we're going to take a 10 minute break um, and then we will be back. Um, I would cut it short, but we've all been sitting a long time. Heavy stuff. We will be back when we will open up the discussion around um, uh, the, the tapes, the, the tape deck, excuse me. Okay, see you in 10. That means, um, well, let's be back at, at 710. So it's really eight. All right.
Hello, um, this is the interpreter. I'm wondering if you can let the other interpreter in. She's in an, another location now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank for, you. Uh, it had slipped down. Perfect. So I'm just going to be very transparent and um, ask. It would be helpful to have someone um, just give the you know the the headlines around what has happened and what we're going to be referring to i know people are still coming in um and heidi are you the person who can do that um oh, to lay out sort of what we're talking about and then we can um hear from PSEP members with their concerns and then we can and questions and then we can also um hear from the community members which i um, i'm seeing a lot of people who i'm assuming have come for that purpose so we'll want to really maximize our time. We're going to do a hard eight o'clock stop. Um, I'm happy to give an overview of the information that's been released at this time. Um, there was a uh, training for- Oh, that Heidi, wait, wait just one second. I wanted to ask second, if I you ask. would do it. Are we back? Are people back? Turn. You can raise a hand or- all right, I'm seeing some, let's just go for it. Yep, thank you. Now now we got people here. Thank you so much, Heidi. Will you um, continue? Yeah, thank you. I'll try to be brief. I think everybody basically knows what's going on. Um, there, were, there was a training materials that um, were released uh, a week and a half ago that were part of RRT, Rapid Response Team Training, and that depicted a number of slides and um, the very last slide in particular had a pretty horrific um, scene. And I don't know if you wanna call it a poem or what you wanna call it, um, but that comes, I understand from the alt night um, that's extremely upsetting, offensive and unconstitutionally violates people's rights. Um, and within the slides, as people have mentioned, there are also other, concerns that have been raised. And I think that um, we're here tonight to talk about that. And I also want to note um, that for Chief Lavelle and I, this matter is currently under investigation. And so there will be some limits to what he and I can share with you tonight. Um, and I do apologize in advance for that, but we'll do our best to answer what we can um, and let you know if if we can't answer because of the investigation, we'll explain that, that that's the reason why. Is that an okay summary for everybody? And if there are questions that come up, you know, we'll, we'll field those as they come. Um, so we're gonna start, as I said, with some time. I'm gonna ask PSEP members one question and a comment at a time, and then you can come back around in line, but I wanna make sure everybody gets a chance. Um, to be heard that would like to be heard. And then again, keeping in mind, you know, the, the shorter that is, the more we're going to get to hear from the community. So, um, Anne, you have your hand up. Thank you. Um, I'm very troubled by this slide deck. I know that we've only seen the last slide, some of us. My question is uh, regarding transparency. Um, Heidi, I know you mentioned that yourself and Chief Lavelle are currently unable to speak about this issue. Maybe I misheard that. My question is this, when did you and the Chief know about this slide deck? Uh, why did it take so long for you to share it with the community? And if you do know, I don't know if Robert Taylor's here tonight, the, uh, the council to uh, uh, Mayor Ted Wheeler. When did the mayor know about this, the slides? Thank you. And I'm gonna hope I remember all the questions. I'm gonna go in reverse order maybe, but um, the slides came to light both for uh, the chief and our office, the city attorney's office and the mayor's office at the end of September of 2021. And there was the delay between that period of time and now, uh, or more recently, a week and a half ago, when they were released. 
Um, the, there is a letter from um, Robert Taylor, the city attorney that just got sent today. And I believe that he shared and posted um, on trending topics. And I'll try to find a link to that or see if um, one of the other attorneys who's here present tonight can find that and we'll post it in the chat for folks. Um, explaining that his thinking at the time, he, he is not able to be here due to a prior commitment with his child. So he, he did, um, he did want to be here, but unfortunately could not. Um, but, um, but explaining his thinking at that time that he, um, we were still the, the PPB was still doing an investigation. Um, he understood that we were going to release this information in response to a, an annual request for records that the DOJ does every year um, and was hoping that we would have additional information as far as who, what, when, and where um, at the time that it would be released. Um, I would just note that in that letter, he acknowledged that um, that in retrospect was not a good idea um, and apologized for that. Did I answer, Anne? Uh, I think you had like three questions, so I don't know if I answered all three. Um, I asked when, uh, I think you said when Robert Taylor knew, uh, when uh, the chief knew, when did the mayor know? Um, I can't say exactly when the mayor knew, but the mayor's office knew around that same period of time. Thank you for those. I'm I'm disgusted by that answer. Are there other PSAP members that want to ask questions or comment at this point? Okay, then um, let's open it up for uh, community members. Um, and please, um, Remember to keep it down in the chat. And then um, if you would like me to read it, you can put it in the chat, but I prefer it's easier if you if you ask your question. Um, your question, your comment, your input, it does not have to be, you know, I mean, if you're here tonight because of that, is there something you wanted to say? Patrick. Yeah, um, I, I, uh, I, well, first of all, as somebody who goes to rallies and marches and parades and all sorts of things, I'm thoroughly embarrassed that, that uh, the police uh, refer to some of the things in this, in other slides in that slide deck it's it's embarrassing that how how uh fragile they seem to be secondly i think it's really important to recognize that the prayer that was given in that slide they call it a prayer in the slide uh so i think it's important to recognize first of all as a catholic that's insulting to me it's 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 definitely based on a a a, a Slide, it's definitely based on a prayer that a, a, a crusader would give during the crusades, which is a time period that I think every Catholic would say is a wrong, it was a wrong in history. Um, Chief Lavelle, uh, Ms. Brown, um, do you recognize that the Fraternal Order of Alt Knights, the group that that, that prayer comes from, is the self-defense arm of the Proud Boys and is, um, the alt left, the, uh, the the Antifa, and further left, have always said that the Portland police have been um, in cahoots with with the Proud Boys, and this this goes directly to that. I don't understand how you can slither out from underneath this rock. Um, and that's that's low. I understand that. I, I don't mean it to be low. Uh, Chief Lavelle, can you answer that? How 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 is it that that uh, we can think of you as anything other than than in relations with the Proud Boys after after the last couple of years and after this slide? Thank you, Patrick. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll say, you know, first of all, um, I wanted to be here in person, uh, virtually in person tonight, because I think this is a, a very important issue, um, something that the, the chief needs to be present at this discussion for. Um, I, like Ann, am very troubled by this slide. Um, it's unprofessional, um, inappropriate, and it just really doesn't uh, reflect the organization well and has no place in our, in our training materials. Uh, flat out, I believe that wholeheartedly. And uh, as soon as we learned of it, we did open an investigation. Um, I can't answer a lot of questions because of that investigation, but I can say that um, it is deeply troubling to me personally, because that's not the kind of stuff I believe in, or I know the vast majority of our organization um, believes in. The officers I've talked to are really, really bothered and disgusted by it. And uh, they believe also it has no place in, in our training. So we're gonna do our investigation. We're going to um, make sure people are held accountable if it comes to that, uh, if the investigation bears out um, that outcome. And what we're doing in the future is to um, you know, send all of our training materials uh, through the training division for vetting before they're taught. I think someone had mentioned before, not all of our, our prior trainings, particularly the ones that were in person or off site, uh, were previously run through the training division. And this, uh, this training took place in April of 2018, but I'm not sure exactly when the actual training materials were created. Uh, so it could predate that training as well. But I think, you know, it does raise a question that we're going to have to look into um, internally and ask ourselves some tough questions. And, uh, you know, I, I'm troubled by it. I'm embarrassed by it. It doesn't reflect what we want to do as an organization, which is build trust and be an organization that people um, trust and are, are really um, wanting to, to represent their city. So we, we're, we're working hard at that right now. We'll see what the investigation uh, what the investigation delivers. And if I could add to that, um, Chief, I also wanna acknowledge Patrick, um, the concern you raised and understand that concern that, um, that uh, this is, a, a, I, I don't wanna call it a prayer, but I guess that's what they called it, that comes from the alt night, um, that, that the um, Southern Poverty Law Center um, finds them to be the violent arm of the Proud Boys, and um, and that your concern that you raised is absolutely a concern that I think the city and the chief and his office um, has regarding the issue of were people who demonstrate and support um, you know Antifa and and more. Uh, I don't know if you want to call radical left viewpoints um, versus radical right, that that um, that was a concern raised a while ago about people being treated differently, depending on your political beliefs. And that this slide um, certainly raises a question and concern about people from the, the left feeling safe um, protesting. And I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you, Heidi. So we have um, Celeste and then Dan Handelman and then Zainab. Hi, uh, a <clears throat> uh, couple of things here. The first thing I wanted to ask is, is it possible in the future moving forward to at least in the beginning have somebody monitor what actual training materials are being used, be they videos or slides or PowerPoints to assure um, um, management and other responsible agencies in the city that this is not happening behind or back. You know, um, we can do all of the after the fact monitoring or assessments of training materials, but that does not guarantee what is being shown at any given moment. It just says what's in your library to be shown. Um, and that's just a, a consideration to help us build back our, our credibility. And then one thing I, I want to say, because it's been asked to me a number of times. Um, and so I'm going to try to balance two kind of opposing positions here as quickly as I can. One is this damages all of our credibility. 
This damages all of our reputations. And so we really have to, we really have to work to show that we are going to be transparent and responsive um, because we depend on our partners, uh, the police, our partners, the city attorneys, our, our um, officers to, to carry out a sacred trust. And um, people ask, how high does this, this attitude, this, this, this really dangerous and toxic attitude go? How far does it flow? How has it been able to persist all these years in Portland and to have what looks like a very surface approach to addressing it and eradicating it? So I'm not saying this to, um, to cascade or, or, or blame anybody. I'm saying this is someone who also, as part of this whole effort, I, I, I see that all of our personality, I mean, not personality, reputations have been tainted and we really have to work hard to recover. And that means asking the hard questions. And again, just to make sure it didn't get lost in my rambling, one of the hard questions is how far has this, does this go? Why has it been allowed to persist for at the very least 30 something years here in the city? I mean, I'm going back to when possums were thrown in storefronts and older black women were dragged out of their windows for failing to make a left turn signal. See, these are the things that create this pervasive attitude that Portland doesn't care. So, you know, I'm just saying, this is a hard question. We have to address this. And, I, and, and thank you all for, for being able to sit through that. Thanks, Celeste. And I am gonna ask people to limit time to get more people because I'm seeing more hands come up. And um, we have um, Dan and then Zainab, then Jonathan, then Casey. And I have a question in the chat, some things in the chat as well. So Dan, Zainab, Jonathan, Casey. Um, can I just really quickly, Celeste, uh, thank you for raising that question um, of how high up does it go? And that is something that we're looking at. And I, um, you know, I think that what we, you know, what we can do is just keep trying to do our best to be better. And, um, and this is, this is, this is a horrible step in our process. And I, I get that. Um, and, um, and I appreciate you asking the question. And we do need to look at that. Thank you, Heidi. Dan, and then Zainab. I, I think I forget to identify myself before I'm Dan Handelman. I use he, him pronouns. I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. And I have two quick comments that I want folks to think about, and then my question. So quick comments. Number one, the city attorney mentioned that we've, there's been a question about bias in the police bureau, but there's also an investigation going on by the OIR group about whether that kind of bias exists. And um, the second thing is that if you look at the slide deck and you look at the information, the metadata in um, Acrobat, it tells you that this, this slide deck was created on April 5 of 2020 and then updated on January 14 when it was released this year. Um, so I don't know what was done with it on April 5 of 2020, but that was in between 2018 and now. Um, so my question uh, to the chief is, um, do you approve the language in slide 61, which refers to marches for police accountability as anti-police? Because that is something that we have struggled with for 30 years at Portland Cop Wash, where people think that when you say you want police to be held accountable, that means you're anti-police. And I think that's very dangerous. What is your thought about that? Thank you. Yeah, and uh, as far as the metadata, I'm, you know, I think a lot of that will get sorted out in the investigation um, that's going on. And uh, I, I don't feel that, you know, marches for police accountability are anti-police. I mean, we have First Amendment rights in this country to voice our opinions and, you know, stand up for things that we don't feel are just. You know, my my parents or, you know, examples of that during the 60s. And I think we, as public servants, we have to support people's First Amendment rights. I've said that a ton, you know, throughout the year and a half. And, you know, I've been in this chair and that, you know, we have a duty to, to create a, a safe space for people to exercise their First Amendment rights, uh, no matter what the topic. 
And that, you know, that's my personal belief on it. And I think organizationally, that's where we stand on it. Thank you, um, Zainab and KC. Thanks, Zainab Folk. She, her pronouns, PSEP member since November, 2020. Um, this question is for the city, city leadership. And I guess it's several questions, but it's all compacted in one and you'll get the understanding of what I'm saying here. What percentage of the city staff comprise of the Portland Police Bureau? How was the city notified about the training slides? What is the role of the Office in Equity and Human Rights, Police Equity Inclusion Office, and any other equity officers or managers within the city and the Police Bureau? When will the Office of Equity and Human Rights provide education and technical support about the equity and racism identified within the slides? to recognize and remove systemic barriers to fair and just distribution of resources, access and opportunity, starting with issues of race and disability. Coco mentioned in a report that I read, again, I was reading reports I read reports um, from Coco about a 2009 training in a knife. And if you can talk of, can you elaborate on why that was part of a police training about the knife? And the reason why I'm referring to that is about the slide with a black hand bearing a knife within the mentioned 2018 um, rapid response training slides. Thank you, Sam. And, oh. Sorry. Hey, that's, we got a whole bunch there. Thank you. I get it, but. The question is, will the information from the racial equity subcommittee regarding when the police, I'm mean, sorry, when the, when everyone learned about it and why they were learned about it and why it was released. So that to me was a main issue is why it was released to the public. And how do you address that at the um, equity, sorry, the uh, racial equity meeting? Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. I can just let you know that the Office of Equity and Human Rights, the police have their own internal equity office. And um, we do, uh, you know, partner with them as we can. They develop their own, um, they have their own um, training specialists. They develop their own racial equity um, uh, uh, training. Um, there's trainings we do from our office about anti-racism and lots of things that, you know, of course, all police are welcome to come to if they'd like. I'll turn it over to you, to, um, Chief, for the other questions. And those might, maybe might be more Heidi's. Yeah, I think at least, I'm sorry, and Zainab, there was a lot in there. And so let me, hopefully I'll get to what you said. Um, but the last thing you were talking about, and um, we did talk about this last Thursday, I just want to make it, I'll say it again tonight, which is why they were released when they were released. Um, they were released just before uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, and Zainab had asked me about why did we release it just before that it seemed to undercut um, the celebration of, um, you know, an amazing person in our history. And what I shared was that um, there was a lawsuit that was filed and that there was going to be a motion to create a class um, at, within that lawsuit and that part of the um, part of the information that was contained within that motion that was going to be attached to that included the one slide at the very end of this full training deck and um, and so the city decided to put the mayor decided that's when he made his release to express that that was going to be coming out and to share that. Um, I think that was sooner than done. It was done earlier than the investigation was complete. So we can't give any more information right now about that aspect of it, which I think we were trying to get that completed beforehand, but, um, but timing wise, that's why it came out when it came out. Um, was there more? I apologize, Anna, because there, there, you, you did. No, say, it's sorry, it's fine. And and what I will say to the biggest piece there for me that I learned was that, well, for me, I'm not sure if you would have released the information, Heidi, because you said you had 180 days. So you may have waited until that last day before you had to, you had to officially um, release the information to DOJ. That's just, that's what I got to take away from. Um, 
However, I'm not saying that's what you, that's what happened. But at the same time, you know, when we were talking about these, power, these PowerPoint slides, I really want Coco to really address, you know, in looking at these slides, I mean, you're all focusing on the last slide and I almost just did the same thing until I actually got access to them on your own website, the city of Portland's website. And when I looked at them and I'm looking through them and I get to the first, the last 10 slides up to that last slide, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, is this real? Is this really real? And so thank you, um, Judith, but there's more that the Office of Equity and Human, right, Human Rights should be doing relating to, and that's why I asked for the director to be at this meeting. Okay, the interim director, the city staff to be here. Okay, the mayor to be here to address these things. And so I understand that Heidi, you are the the, turn, the city the attorney. I get this. I get this is a legal right now. It's an, an investigation. Um, but will Coco be following up on this investigation as they continue to be um, synthesizing um, this data? Um, yeah, and Zainab, just let me say, um, happy to have that conversation. I'm the senior policy advisor for the office. I can have that conversation about how what we're what we're doing um, as soon as you know, whenever you would like, so we can talk about that. Um, oh no, I don't need. I don't want anything private. I think the public. We're, we're here for the community. I'm engaging right, these questions right. for the so, community. And, and um, Judith. if people are interested in the role of the office, let us know. We'll hold a meeting for that because I think it's important for people to know. But let's stay on PSAP role at this point the mayor's this office is, the city attorney okay. right judith, it's not judith yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna debate with you right now I'm not asking you to say now what i need for you to facilitate facilitate and what i'm gonna do is say again i ask for the director the interim director of the office of equity and human rights to be here because they are a part of our bylaws and they were also written in the resolution the city resolution okay Okay, so we, just, we can discuss that more. Thank you very much. Appreciate the comments. Casey, Jonathan, Patrick, Amy. Hello there. Thank you very much, Casey Lewis. Um, have been following this uh, this development both professionally and just as a citizen of Portland. Um, and I guess my question is for Chief Lavelle. Um, I mean, I acknowledge uh, I too am horrified that the city kept this covered up for so long. I am not at all convinced that this would ever have come out unless they were forced to bring it out by Don't Shoot Portland. They can certainly make all of the after the fact justifications that they want, but the fact is they only released this to the public. They only released it to the Department of Justice when it was about to come out in a lawsuit. And so it's entirely possible that if it had, there hadn't been a lawsuit, none of us ever would have learned about this. Um, but Looking back further, um, and frankly, to build on something that Zainab said, there was a lot of really bad stuff in this slide deck. It wasn't just that alt night prayer, although I think that is the worst, um, but there were references to protesters as not just being anti-police, but being riffraff and lower class. Uh, there were references to police being justified in using force when protesters do exercise passive resistance, which is not just horrifying, it is a misstatement of the law. Um, and this slide deck has existed for three years about, um, and no one came forward to tell the city about it, to tell the chief of police about it, to tell the public about it, to tell anyone about it in that entire time until it was discovered in September. Now, we still don't know how it was discovered, but there was uh, there were people in the Portland Police Bureau who saw this and thought it was fine and didn't think that it was anything they had to come forward with. Um, and no one came forward with it. So I guess my question for Chief Lavelle is, where exactly are the good apples in your bureau who are keeping an eye out for these things? Yeah, you know, and then like I said, I the investigation will show more details, but I'm not even sure how that slide was presented, if people in that training actually saw it and consumed it whether that slide was put in there later. Um, until that investigation is complete, I'm not gonna have a lot of details about actually, you know, the slides actual perception by people. But it is something I would expect people to take offense at and to, um, you know, to take some type of steps to either report that or address it in some way um, if they did if they did see it and were able to, you know, to, to read it and 
um, kind of process it. I don't know if that slide was actually shown or taught during the training. Um, that's something the investigation should prove out. Excuse me, can I just ask a follow-up question? I know, Judith, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, there's a cue. So so absolutely you can as soon as we get through. And I'm sorry, but I wanna, uh, I, I'm, okay, Patrick, you've already been heard from. Let's get Amy and then Anne will come to you. Thank you, Judith. Um, okay, I don't want anybody feeling bad about this or taking anything wrong, but I just got done scanning the first 70 pages of that quote unquote training guide. And um, from a trainer myself and someone who's kind of does a lot of uh, training module reading and studying, it was poorly constructed from start to finish. I think if this is what folks are considering excellent training material, we got a serious problem, okay? Because there's a lot of references in there that are very disturbing, like Zainab and everyone was saying, um, the iron fist messaging was really like bad. And um, that protesters could be thinking about abortion. Like how in the world is that even part of this? You, you guys really need to look at who's creating these slides and whether or not it really, really is the material that the city wants to have represented as its training guides. So I don't know who wrote the training material, but it sounds very personal rather than professional. So I would advise everybody to look at that whole entire uh, PowerPoint presentation from like a back step view of, would I use this in my job as a training material. That, that's how I need everybody to kind of look at what I'm looking at is, would I use that messaging in my training materials? And my answer would be no and probably hell no. Okay, so please everybody read the whole thing without getting emotional and just look at how poorly it was constructed. Amy, so that's just you. kind of my messaging. Thank you, Judith. Thanks. Byron, was your hand up? Yeah, so it was just a statement or comment. Um, what I've been hearing all night is that this is um, pretty much boils down to me is a systematic racism, uh, white supremacy, that this is all based off of. Um, this is in the history and the fabric of America. Um, it has to be changed in some way, some fashion. I don't say much, I'd like to listen. I just know that, again, rules don't matter if we don't have the right person implementing them and the right person who has morals and standards and who can bring out accuracy, clarity, and fairness in every police person that's working the streets. Um, that's all that slide was. I didn't even watch it. Just hearing you guys, I already know what it's about. I know that it's systematically racism and it's directed towards African-Americans, period. And that was just my comment, Judah, thank you. Byron, thank you so much. member, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Please, thank you so much for speaking up. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Chief. Did you want to respond directly to that? Uh, uh, more or less to the two previous uh, comments too. Uh, you know, my hope is going forward we can prevent this type of thing from happening again. I think two of the things that I'm hopeful will help are one, our able training, which we spoke about a little earlier, the active bystander ship for law enforcement. Um, it really speaks to intervening when you see something that is wrong. And that's just not on the street. I mean, that could be in a training, in you know, preparation of materials or something of that nature too. And I think that's really shows the importance of it and how that ha I hope has the real potential to create a culture of intervening and keeping you know, bad things from happening. And also I think uh, bringing in the civilian academic director to the training division and having all the training materials go through and be vetted by training will help this in the future too. So those are two things that we're doing that I'm hoping will speak to the future um, with in incidents like this. One more thing, if I could add um, to the chief just raised two great things. Um, 
and this was raised earlier, Zainab, about uh, by you about equity training. Um, the equity manager at PPB, Marlon Marion, has started um, equity training specific to PPB. Um, I think it was in the last COCOL report as well. But regardless of whether it was or wasn't, there are four. Um, they're, they're virtual, you know, they're online trainings right now. But there were four videos put together to start on the on equity training, and those were focused on racial equity. Um, I'm sure that Marlon would be more than happy to come and share more about his work in um, in 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 helping move the bureau forward uh, on the, this issue of the the issue broadly around equity, but also specifically focused on racial equity. Um, that Thank is the core goal for the city. Thank you, Heidi. And they've actually, that office has provided training for, for longer than that. So, so Marlon's a great resource. Okay, um, Patrick, Zainab, and Gloria. Yeah, if it was just the last slide, I, I would believe you, Chief Lavelle. The, the last slide is insulting to everybody. It's, uh, it's it, it, yeah, but every slide in that has something wrong with it. It is a completely, uh, I, I very rarely agree with with Amy Anderson, but it, it, she's right. The, 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 it, at random, you can pick a slide. The one that stood out to me was the, the slide where it calls uh, fire, where it implies that fireworks are a deadly weapon. Now, I've been shot with fireworks. I'm alive. I've also been shot at by the Portland police with, with uh, less lethal rounds. There are people that die from those. Are they also calling those lethal weapons as well? Are they are they deadly? Your less lethal rounds, and if so, why are they not called out as well? That's just on that one slide. Now, the whole, you know, if this was a counterinsurgency effort by by the U.S. government, they would give wins once in a while to the, to the people to make them believe that they were on their side. You guys aren't doing that. You, you guys are failing at that. You're, you're failing at doing your job. And I, I don't see an apology once in a while, uh, you know, a, hey, you know, I'm going to write a letter and put it in my own file to, to, you know, say that I did something wrong, Chief Lavelle, or Heidi saying, you know, hey, this is, you know, this is something we, we, we decided to do. No, it, it's not something you decided to do. Don't shoot PDX made you made you have to release that document. And you released it the night before a weekend. So you hoped it would get away without major repercussions. But guess what? It did. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So now Zainab and then Gloria, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Heidi, for bringing up the Marlon Marion, because um, that's where I first learned um, that someone was talking about it in your, in the city, um, is I got an um, email about the piece. That's the, the Police Equity Advisory Council. Um, do you attend those meetings, um, Chief Lavelle? Um, and if so, hopefully, I know at that meeting, Judith was at this meeting, Judith Mallory was at this meeting. I'm not sure if you are representing the Office of Equity and Human Rights or you're just representing yourself. What capacity were you representing at the, at the was, meeting? I, well, I was there in from my role in the, I go to those meetings in my role as, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And so at this meeting, <laughs> you know, they're having some really frank conversations. Um, and we learned uh, from a, a, I think she's a member that her, I was kind of afraid to share this because I really don't know, but I know the meeting was recorded, um, but she shared that her son was an officer and he spoke with her about the fact that there were trainers who were racist. And there was a lot of information that came out of that meeting, Judith, and that's why I've been waiting for the Office of Equity and Human Rights to put out a statement, put out something um, that's, that's gonna help this city, help take some leadership, take some, um, anyways, you, you get, the, where I'm coming from, everyone, is that, you know, there has to be leadership here, and there's none. I mean, the mayor, I haven't seen him. 
<laughs> you know, at any of our PSEP meetings. Um, I see some, a lot of, like, I like the chat. You know, it goes fast. I like the chat because people are thinking, thinking, and you're only, you can only think in the question at that moment when the discussion is happening. Um, but there's a lot of questions in that chat that I hope that we will address, um, especially about the conflict of interest. Okay, and I saw that question that was mentioned between the PSEP and COCO and the fact that we had a joint um, session on Sunday. You know, our role as PSEP members is change. I've seen it changing, you know, just in this, in this meeting, I've seen it change. Okay, and so I do have a lot of concerns um, about this um, and about this entire um, not just, just the slides and the PowerPoints, but just the, the lack of integrity, the lack of leadership, okay? And the lack of transparency that could have probably prevented, like, again, Chief Lavelle, if you looked at those slides, and I'm not sure, hopefully you got the slides when everyone else got the slides in September. And if not, I have a problem with that um, because you are the chief of police, all right? Um, but I have, I have been looking at a lot of things on the website, and that's why I brought up the United States State Department. So I'll, I'll ask you again about your relationship with the United States State Department, because there's a website controlled by the city of Portland that ties you together. And it's the Join PPB website. And I was very concerned about this website. Um, and so have you seen that website, Chief Lavelle? We have a recruiting website that I think is on, under the joinportlandpolice.com um, web address. Is that what you're referring to, Zainab? It's join PPB, and that was the, the web, yes, the recruitment. Yes, have you seen that website? Um, I, I've, I think ours is joinportlandpolice.com, but I don't know it to be join PPB, but I can look at it. No, it's, it's the join PBB is what it says on the website. I'm not okay. sure about the link. I can put the link in okay. the um in the in the in the um chat. Is that okay, Judith? Yes, please. That would be okay, great. Okay, thank you. Great. Um thank you for that. Gloria. I'm sorry, you're on mute again. <laughs> I know. It's annoying. Still mute. Sometimes if you hit your space bar, it will take the mute off. Gloria, just type it in the chat. No, that's all right. We'll wait for her to be able to talk. Um, we asked for that. Um, How about that? There you go. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I was so disturbed. I went through all of those slides and the part that just stuck out so clear for me was where they said that Poor people were anti-government. And I was just wondering to my soul, how many of us who protested in the 60s, and I can remember it, and the 70s and the 80s, how many of us were viewed as anti-government? I never viewed myself as anti-government, but that sounds like it's a throwback from J. Edgar Hoover's time. But that's not what I wanted to get to. I wanted to get to a statement that was made by one of my sisters. And I, I really want to read it. It's very short. So if you don't mind, Judith. Sure, please. Thank you. The fact that city attorneys were going to wait to share that horrible slide with the Justice Department just says volumes about their judgment, their lack of a sense of urgency and their lack of understanding of the cumulative harm and damage that has been done to Portlanders. This needs to be taken out of their hands. Former State Senator Abel Gordley. Anybody want to comment? Gloria, I want to thank you for saying that. And um... You know, I, I think all I can say is you're right that it should have been disclosed before. Um, you know, I don't I don't have a better answer than that. Mm -hmm. um, so you are right. And this car caused a lot of harm 
and now it's on you know us to try to build that back Heidi or Chuck Lavelle, Byron Vaughn, Peace Up member, um, did anybody review the slides before they thought about showing it or did they just go straight to showing it? They wouldn't have. What, uh, Byron, do you mean when it was in from 2018? Yeah, the slides that were so, um, the slides that we're talking about, did anybody preview the slides before they thought about showing it to see if this if it's going to hurt anybody or if, because you know it seems like they're using stuff from years ago when nothing's been recalibrated or anything you know let's look at this before yeah. we say this to our community or give this to our uh, you know training people that were coming in to the new staff that's coming in um i can say that i think um it was mentioned a little earlier that there were there have been trainings and and the chief talked about this there were trainings that were done by um specialty units. Um, so there's canine unit, there's um, crisis intervention teams, there's various different groups of officers who respond to certain types of situations. And they, because there's a small group of them, they, they have historically done their own training. And um, I think put that training together themselves. And what the chief was explaining earlier is that that will not happen again. He has put out a you know clear order that all training, regardless of size, regardless of who, must go through the training division. Um, and then in addition, you know, we'll have the new civilian academic director. Um, and you know, hopefully all these things will help stop um, these types of horrible things from happening and and not just as you've all said the last slide but many things within the slide deck are very concerning um and those are things that absolutely we need to look at and make sure that we're not continuing to reinforce um beliefs that are white supremacist or um or biased in any way against anybody Thank you, Heidi. So I want to say something about the time because we are out of time. I did promise a hard stop at eight. I am going to, there's just a couple more things I think that need to happen. So one of them is to tell you that the racial equity subcommittee had a conversation and an open dialogue about this at the last meeting. Um, they chose to have a second meeting uh, in the month, which will be on the third. It's on our website so that, um, so that there, this could be a continued discussion um, the goal being to put the to figure out what is PSEP's role and how should PSEP respond. Um, and um, I I really, really want to keep this short. So I'm going to call on Rochelle and then Celeste, and then we will. Um, and if people feel a need for more discussion, um, you know, you can certainly let PSEP know that, write us, and we will pass that on. So Rochelle and then Celeste, and then we're going to say good night. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to make a comment while uh, the chief was here. Uh, this is not a training issue. Uh, as Celeste said earlier, this has been going on for years and years and years. Uh, we can talk about possums. We can talk about other things. This is the latest iteration. And if you focus only on training and tightening up, you'll be missing the problem. This is a symptom. This is not the problem. The problem is the culture. And uh, I, I hope you hear what I'm saying and I hope you pay attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Celeste, what would you like to add? Oh, just briefly, I wanted to let people know when we do meet on the third, what we will be doing is working on the uh, information we have already received and bringing it forth to craft a response. So we won't be taking any new information. We'll be jointly working on the response from the PSEP uh, Racial Equity Subcommittee. So I did want to clear that up. So if you have input and you didn't give it when we had our prior meeting, please email us uh, um, so that we can include it because I don't want you to feel like we're cutting off conversation, but we'll be in a whole different stage of process at this next meeting. Thank you. Um, um, and absolutely, Zainab, any feedback that we get through the, the, the PSEP um, 
uh, website we, we, pa we will pass on to y'all. Um, and again, thank you all so much. Um, that was not my request, Judith. So I would recommend that a group email be created, including all current PSET members, so that it makes it easier for our community to get the community feedback ourselves. Thank you. Well, you all have um, addresses. You you all have addresses um, on that. You have you have city addresses for that purpose. Um, so anyway, um, we can talk about that. Really great to um, see you all tonight. Thank you for coming out and sharing your concerns. Thank you, Chief, for being here and responding, and City Attorney, everyone who was involved. And thank you, Coco. We will see you um, at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Wakiana, I'm sorry I didn't have time to call on you.